All right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, we hope that you guys enjoyed your lunch and uh, ice cream social. We're going to continue now with the uh, emergent scientist uh, session. So from the abstracts that we received, we selected three uh, abstracts to uh, be um, uh, presented today by three emergent scientists. <clears throat> and the first emergent scientist we're going to hear from is Dr. James Lee. James Lee is a postdoctoral scholar in the St. Pierre's lab in the Department of Neuroscience at Baylor College of Medicine. <clears throat> James develops techniques that combine microscopy and flow cytometry. He uses computer vision, optics, and synthetic biology to enable experiments that were previously difficult or impossible to conduct. For example, he recently developed a versatile workflow called Spotlight that can rapidly isolate individual, individual cells with interesting spatial and temporal properties. For this work, James was awarded the Tony B. Travel Award from the Society for Laboratory Automation and Screening, and also the Invasion Fellowship from Rice University. James received his Master in Infection and Immunity at the University College of London and his PhD in Systems, Synthetic and Physical Biology at Rice University. The name of his talk today is Versatile Phenotype Activated Cell Sorting. Welcome. So thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, did I get the laser pointer? Yeah, so the talk of the presentation, uh, it's, I think it's a little bit too flamboyant for me, uh, but my PI thought it was a nice title. So um, at the end, it's basically trying to increase the things that you want to um, study and visualize and allowing isolation um, of interesting cells that show spatial and temporal properties and then sorting those cells for down, uh, downstream um, profiling and other kinds of experiments. Um, so yeah, for the next 10 minutes or so, I would like to inform you of this new method that combines microscopy and facts uh, together and maybe inspire some of you to try the method out uh, yourself. And so we care about spatial and temporal properties because biological entities like uh, proteins, cells, tissues, organisms um, move in space and change over time. And so properties like cellular morphology or subcellular morphology or cell-to-cell -cell interaction and cellular activity um, are important to understand um, disease onset, progression, also developing new therapeutics and diagnostics, and also for engineering purposes as well, when you want to engineer more complex biological systems that have certain um, spatial and temporal properties. And one way to do this is to map um, phenotype to genotype. And um, a, a method to do this is to um, uh, study the, the certain properties uh, of, of your sample at the single cell level, isolate them, um, and then do downstream profiling, including omics and other methods. And then finally map the profile that you obtain from the profiling to the phenotype that you observe. And uh, a very good method of isolating cells, of course, we all know it's fluorescence activated cell sorting. And so you can start off with millions and millions of cells with a heterogeneous population, you can then use your effects or, or cell sorting device to look at the fluorescence and, and sort cells based on fluorescence. And it's great because it really has the high throughput of measuring thousands to ten, tens of thousands of cells um, per second. However, um, a critical limitation with uh, effects or cell sorting, uh, fluorescence activated cell sorting, is that it does not have um, uh, ability to me measure spatial, or the, at least the conventional ones don't have the ability to measure spatial and temporal properties. Um, I think people are working on this. Now we can do some, some level of spatial information, and I think DD is releasing a new device, so let's see how, how good the spatial resolution uh, is. Um, but usually when people want to study spatial and temporal um, properties, they, they um, go and look at microscopy. And there are methods out there that allow you to isolate cells after visualizing your sample. For example, laser capture microdissection. You place a tissue sample on your microscope. There is a strong laser. And once you define the, the region of interest on your sample, there's a strong laser that excites a certain region. And you can isolate them and, and then um, profile them. There's also methods that use like a very small micro pipettes that um, after visualizing your cells on the microscope, there is a very small pipette that goes down into your sample, um, picks them up, and then you can do your downstream profiling. Um, however, these methods are largely manual. Um, if you ever use laser capture mic micro dissection, it's really a uh, pain. It's very slow and it's also not versatile in that um, when you change your experimental protocol, you have to 
you need drastic reoptimization of the entire process. So to solve this problem, we develop a method called Spotlight, which basically stands for single cell phenotypic observation and tagging with light. So with Spotlight, you can visualize uh, spatial and temporal properties and then conduct high throughput isolation. And the method is versatile because we can adapt to different kinds of experimental uh, preparation. So basically we um, um, did uh, develop Spotlight by combining the best of two worlds, the microscopy um, aspect by, um, which basically allows you to capture spatial and temporal information. And then also the, the, the cell sorting aspect, which allows you to do high throughput isolation and combining the two to, to get the best out of the, out of the two worlds. And so when we started this project, there was um, um, one unknown that we really had to solve. Like, how do we connect microscopy with um, uh, back sorting? And so we decided to use a method called optical tagging. Um, and basically what optical tagging is, you visualize your cell under the microscope and you look at your spatial and temporal properties. For example, this blue cell looks interesting. And what you can do is then you can precisely um, shine light only onto those cells that, that look interesting to change the fluorescent state of those interesting looking cells. And uh, guess what? what's very good at detecting um, fluorescent state? Fax devices. So then we detach the entirety of the cell and run it through a conventional fax device and therefore allow us to isolate cells that showed interesting phenotype under the microscope. So yeah, this is basically how the optical tagging works. And for optical tagging, you basically require a process called photoactivation and a hardware device, uh, DMD, on your microscope. So photoactivation basically utilizes a, uh, a, a special reagents called photoactivatable fluorescent protein, or it could be a dye. So they are special in that they exist in a dark state or a dim state. But once you shine a phototransforming light, it activates into a bright fluorescent state. For example, PM cherry is a photoactivatable red fluorescent protein, so they're dark. But once you shine a violet light, it activates into a bright red fluorescent protein. And to um, regulate this phototransforming light only onto a very specific region of your sample, we use a thing called uh, a digital micromirror device or a DMD. Basically, these are like micromirrors, um, um, an array of micromirrors that can twist and turn uh, in a way. And you, what you can do is you can define a stimulation mask at the software level. And um, once you shine light, after you define the stimulation mask, the, the, the pattern that you define on the mask will show up um, on the sample plane like this. So in, in terms of um, the experiment, what we do is we use the DMD to restrict the light onto a very specific region uh, of, uh, or, or the region where you see interesting cell to activate these reagents and, and only on those cells. Um, so first we wanted to characterize this and then show that we can really um, tag individual cells in a very dense culture. So here you're seeing a uh, yeast cell um, it's a very dense culture. There's like 5,000 cells uh, in a field of view expressing a green fluorescent protein and a photoactivatable uh, M cherry. And if you zoom into this white box region, you can see something here where you can see the cells a little bit better. And we draw a stimulation mask around this arbitrarily selected cell. Before we photoactivate or optically tag, we don't see any RFP fluorescence. Once we do, we see an increase of, of this cell only. So if we see an interesting cell under the microscope, we can basically zap with light to, to tag them. And because versatility was a very important design criteria for us, we decided to test this for many different kinds of cell types. So we also tested in human cells and virtually you can do the same thing. And we quantified it where you can look at the fluorescence change over time and only the target cell increase while the neighboring cells show minimal um, increase in fluorescence. And you can do this also using dyes um, as mentioned before. Um, and also in um, like 3D tissue like organoids, for example. And so, yeah, for dyes will be useful in cases where expressing exogenous PM cherry might be difficult. For example, like primary cell line where it's difficult to transfect or transduce. Um, so yeah, the overall the optical tagging method is, is highly um, versatile. And next we also then needed to need to automate um, the optical tagging process because uh, you can't really have someone uh, manually tagging like hundreds of thousands of cells uh, in front of the microscope. So we, um, wanted to automate the entire image analysis and optical tagging process and, and characterize how pre precise this method is. So what we did was we um, had an experiment where we had two population of cells, uh, one expressing GFP and a PM cherry and the other um, expressing BFP and PM cherry. And then we diluted the GFP positive cells like thousandfold so that they're a minor population of cells. And the idea was then for the soft 
take images and the software to identify the GFP positive cell, optically tag them, um, change the fluorescent state, and then fax sort them to see how many of the RFP positive cells were indeed GFP positive to identify the true positive rate, and how many of them were actually BFP positive to identify the false positive rate. And so here we use yeast again, and you can see a GFP cell among the BFP cells. Before optical tagging, we don't see red fluorescence, and the software goes and automatically identifies them, zaps them with, with light, and once it does, we see the increase in red fluorescence. And when we uh, sort them and then look at the RFP positive um, cells, 29 out of 31 were indeed GFP positive. And then we repeated this for different cell types, like yeast and mammalian cells, and the average precision was above 90% for both yeast and mammalian cells. Um, so basically, Spotlight works like this. Um, so you start off with a cell type of interest. Uh, it could be bacteria, yeast, human cells, or organoids. These are the, some, some of the cell types that we, we tested for optical tagging. You introduce a phototransformable protein or a dye. You can optionally introduce like a, a mutagenesis library to your cell type. You can um, add some perturbation, chemical per perturbation or genetic perturbation like a CRISPR uh, library. And then you do your um, imaging to look at spatial and temporal properties uh, of your cells and then do uh, automatic uh, image analysis um, and identify the target cells that show interesting phenotype do the optical tag, precise optical tagging, uh, sort them, and then do a downstream profiling, including omics and sequencing. Um, and so for, to show the utility of the platform, we decided to do a protein engineering exper experiment using the platform. Um, and we wanted to optimize the photostability of a yellow fluorescent protein. And photostability uh, is a temporal property because you have to monitor the, ch the fluorescence change over time. So we thought it would be a good application to show the utility of the platform. And we wanted to do a very high throughput pooled single cell level screening. Um, uh, yeah, so we uh, basically chose MVNES, which is a commonly used YFP as a parental um, yellow fluorescent protein. We did a mutagenesis library based on this uh, variant. We also co-expressed a PM cherry for optical tagging and a tag BFP to normalize the expression level variability that we see at the single cell level. So we de develop a single cell library where individual cells here are, are expressing an individual, um, uh, a different type of uh, in Venus variant. We then photo bleach the cells on the microscope for 45 seconds. And once we, once the software identifies a cell that shows um, high photo stability, we optically tag them and sort them and then sequence and do a downstream um, characterization to identify what mutation caused the beneficial um, uh, phenotype. So this will be like a typical image that you see. We, in total, we screened around 3 million um, variants. And this is like, uh, once again, you see several thousand cells per image. And this is just one of like 100 images that you see um, and when we do our screening. And we do um, um, image analysis. If you zoom into this uh, red box region here, you can see the cells. And after photo bleaching for 45 seconds, you can actually see some cells do decrease in fluorescence. Um, we use BFP to normalize and also do segmentation to do that single cell level image analysis. And we use the raw images to extract um, um, the, and quantify um, these, um, uh, the, the parameters that we want to improve. And so basically at the end, after image analysis, what we get is something very similar to a fax plot where individual data points represents individual cells. But unlike facts, we can have like spatial and temporal properties on the axes. Now, for example, photostability in one of the axes where we look at fluorescence at different time points. Um, and also unlike um, conventional facts, you can um, link these data points to actual um, raw images of the cells. And you can also track them over time. Um, and yeah, look at their brightness and, and the, the fluorescence uh, levels over time. For screening purposes, we, we ch basically chose cells that um, looked like cell A, basically, and then we drew a gate around these um, cells, optically tagged them, fax sort them, and, and, and try to sequence them. And we did this like around eight times uh, of this kind of screening, and we managed to develop a, the most photostable yellow fluorescent protein to date called M-Gold, which is around four to five fold more photostable than the existing YFPs. Um, and because our screening is, is very high throughput, we quickly outdated our uh, M goal. So we now have an M goal too, which we're preparing our, our uh, new manuscript, which is around like 15 fold more photostable. And so we, with more photostable um, fluorescent protein, you can do like long time lapse imaging, high um, temporal resolution imaging, where the parental and Venus 
um, photo bleaches rapidly where you lose signal after a um, long period of time, your photostable and gold retains uh, most of that signal. Um, and photo protein engineering is just one of the examples that you could use um, um, with this approach. There were, soon after we published our paper, there were other groups that released uh, very similar approaches. Uh, for example, this group here, um, Jens Schaft et al, um, looked at ex vivo lung cancer models. They uh, stained the, the lung cancer model with, with the dye, did imaging, and then optically labeled certain regions of the tumor to um, isolate them and look at immune infiltrating, infiltrating immune cells, for example. You could also do like CRISPR screens where you look at mitophagy under the microscope at the single cell level and also introduce like a CRISPR eye uh, into your cell type to see what genes were downregulated and, and link the, the, the spatial phenotype. Uh, type to the uh, to the genotype. Yeah, so with that, I would like to thank my uh, advisor, uh, Francois St. Pierre, in the neuroscience department at Baylor College of Medicine for coming up with the idea, guiding me uh, during my PhD process, and all the lab members, uh, especially Harvey, who was really the the mastermind behind the image analysis software and computer vision aspect, and and the funding agency, of course. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. That was a really interesting talk and an interesting technology. Uh, we have one question from the um, online chat. The question is, how much time is needed from the light tagging to fact sort? Uh, how much time is needed for light tagging to fact sort? So in our publication um, for optical tagging of individual cells, it took around um, 45 seconds to 60 seconds per cell to, to do the labeling. So it, then you can scale that to the number of cells that you want to isolate. Uh, our recent version of our hardware, we reduced that time to one second. So it really depends on how many cells you want to optically tag. Um, so in, in practice, we isolated around like, um, like 200 cells uh, max, and it took around like two hours for us. So it, it, we had like two hours. Um, from imaging, op it took two hours to optically tag, and then yeah, imaging two hours of optical tagging and then fact sorting. But then we can reduce that time now. Um, yeah. Thank you. There's no other questions. And thank you very much. It, it's my pleasure to introduce the next. Next speaker, next emerging scientist, uh, Vera Adema. Uh, she's currently a postdoc at here, here in MD Anderson, but she got her master's and, and PhD back in, in, in Barcelona, in, in Spain, and, and then had first postdoc at, at Cleveland Clinic before moving, moving here. And her studies have been about uh, bone marrow dysplasias and, and malignancies, and, and she's speaking today especially about the uh, development or problems with, with red blood cell development. Thank, Thank you. you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we would like to thank the committee for selecting our abstract. So myelodysplastic syndromes, or MDS, is a clonal stem cell disorder that is characterized by the bone marrow dysplasia, peripheral blood cytopenias, and an increased risk of progression to acute myeloid leukemia. The clinic and pathological characteristics of MDS are due to recurrent somatic mutations. And the most common mutations that we find in MDS are in a splicing factor gene and specifically in SF3B1, which accounts for almost 25% of the mutations that we will see in this case. So today I'm gonna talk about a subgroup of MDS that is the MDS with ring sideroblast. So this group of patients, the MDS arrest, up to 80% will show mutations in SF3B1, which will cause the aberrant splicing of the heme transporters, which will make um, the iron the iron inside the mitochondria to get stuck. And then we will see this characteristic ring zero blood. These patients then will have 
anemia and will end up developing transfusion dependency. There has been a lot of efforts to find new therapies for this patient, and it has been recently approved, the lusfaster tep but the responses to this treatment is only 40%. There has been other strategies trying to target um, splicing inhibitors, but these therapies fall short of expectations. So there is a real need for these patients to find new treatment. So the aim of our study was to understand why this anemia is happening in these patients. It's because there is an aberrant differentiation at the level of the hematopoietic stem cell, or is because we have like a downstream effect that it's not allowing the terminal erythroid differentiation. So to answer these questions, um, we perform single cell RNA sequencing of lineage negative C34 positive cells selected by FAC. And from five untreated SF3V1 mutant MDSRS patient and to edge match healthy donor controls. And what we found is that the MDS HSCs have a predominant differentiation towards the erythroid megakaryocytic progenitors, as you can see here. And there is a decreased lymphoid differentiation and there is a decreased frequency of the HSCs. When we then studied the transcriptomic analysis of the HSCs compartment and the erythroid megakaryocytic progenitors, we saw that there was like a metabolic activation, which this is probably possibly happening because there is like a, a low percentage of erythrocytes at the level of the peripheral blood. We then, from the same patients, we studied the cells, uh, the mononuclear cells, from the exact the same patients. And we saw that there was an increase of the erythroblast, as you can see here, and a decrease of the B-lymphocyte, which is consistent with the data that I just presented to you at the level of the HSPC. So then our question was like, okay, so inside this erythroid cluster, we try to understand which was the expression profile of all these clusters. So the erythroid differentiation has two phases. One is the part of the early differentiation that we have like the surface marker CKID or the endoglin. And then we move towards a more terminal erythroid differentiation that started at the probasophilic erythroblast and which are characterized by the expression of KLF1, GATA1 and the globin G. So what we saw here is that the patients with MDS and ring sideroblast show an increased frequency of the terminal erythroid differentiation, basically at the level of the orthochromatic erythroblast. So at this point, we had like all these fantastic single cell data, but we wanted to understand if this was real. So we moved to flow cytometry to study the terminal erythroid differentiation. So to study this, we applied two different panels. This first panel included CD45, band 3, which increases towards the erythroid differentiation, and the CD49D, which decreases towards the terminal erythroid differentiation. So we first selected our cells for the CD45 negative, and then we studied the distribution of the expression of the CD49D and the band 3. And then we were able to, see, well, to locate each stage of the terminal erythroid differentiation, as you can see in the picture. We performed the same analysis in three MDS with ring sideroblast and three healthy match donor healthy controls. And we saw that the MDS RS patient had an increased percentage of cells located in the clusters five, which is cluster five is the one that, um, well, that cluster five or orthochromatic erythroblast is the same which this confirms our single cell data that the MDS patients have like the terminal erythroid differentiation is at rest at the level of the orthochromatic erythroblast. The other panel that we use is a more classical panel that includes CD45, CD71, and C235A. As you know, C71 will decrease towards the terminal erythroid differentiation, while C235A will increase during differentiation. So in this case, uh, what we saw is that the MDS patients have an increased frequency of cells at the level of more undifferentiated cells, which are the C71 positive, 
And then there is a reduction of the cells in the double positive gate, the C71, C235. Then we decided to move and understand what was happening in these cells. So why they get um, blocked in this orthochromatic state. So we performed transcriptomic analysis of this erythroid cluster and we saw that at the level of the probaso and polychromatic erythroblast, there was an upregulation of the EIF to AK1 path. So EIF to AK1 is a stress sensing kinase that when there is a deficiency of him, it phosphorylates its downstream effector, the EIF to S1. This will reduce the translation of globins and will increase the expression of ATF4. In our case, because the SF3B1 mutation is permanent, so it's chronic in this patient, this will activate the DDIP3 that will activate the autophagy at the level of the orthochromatic erythroblast and will block the maturation at this stage. So with these results, we hypothesize if EIF to AK1 upregulation is what is keeping the orthochromatic erythroblast blocked, if we could deplete this gene, we should be able to overcome this blockage. So we perform CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing technology and we deplete EIF to AK1 in primary SF3B1 mutant C34 positive cells derive erythroblast. So we use a pre-established three-phase culture system that allows the differentiation of the erythroblast. And at day 13 of culture, we... How, I don't know how to remove this, but you see the most important ones is that we perform the, we perform, um, the um, at day number 13, we assess the expression of the proteins. And as you can see, the eif 2 ak one that is the gene that we depleted, you cannot see the protein here, and the downstream effector is not here either. So then we perform flow cytometry to see what was happening with these cells. And what we could see is that the depleted cells showed a decreased frequency at the level of the CD71, and there was a shifting of the population towards the double positive, which are more differentiated cells, as well as in the compartment of the CD2, 235A positive cell, which this means that there is like a push towards the terminal erythroid differentiation. We perform the exact same analysis, but in healthy donors. And in this case, we couldn't see any significant difference between the non-target single guide and the eif 2 ak one depleted cells. We then perform bulk RNA sequencing, and we saw that when we depleted eif 2 ak one there was an upregulation of the mitochondrial iron transport genes and the genes involved in heme biosynthesis. So this is important because the SF3B1 is causing the misesplicing of these genes. And this misesplicing is what is causing this aberrant terminal erythroid differentiation. So we think that because when we downregulate or deplete the if 2 ak one we can overcome this situation. This is the mechanism through what the cell can overcome the deficient terminal erythroid differentiation. So today, I just explained you that SF3B1 mutations induce a more um, erythroid megakaryocytic differentiation. That SF3B1 blocks the terminal differentiation at the level of the orthochromatic erythroblast, that there is an increased expression, well, an upregulation of the EIF to AK1 pathway and that this, when we deplete this gene, we can overcome this deficient terminal erythroid differentiation and we can recover the hematopoiesis in this patient. Well, the erythropoiesis in this patient. Well, I would just like to thank everyone like in my lab and all the help that we always get from the flow core at the South Campus in MD Anderson. Thank you.
Our uh, last speaker for the Emerging Scientist section will be uh, Dr. Michaela Marketi. She got her PhD in experimental oncobiology at the University of Palermo. Uh, she did a postdoc at the anesthesiology department at the University of Texas Medical Branch at Galveston. Uh, she has since moved on to the neurology department and has advanced as a research scientist at the Mitchell Center for Neurodegenerative Research at UTMB where she studies synaptic vulnerability and toxicity in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, today, she's going to uh, share one of the methods she uses in her research. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to share my work today with you. Um, um, just a little bit of a ground, uh, just to walk you through the why uh, we developed the method that I'm going to talk about. My research is mainly focused on Alzheimer's disease, which is a progressive neurodegenerative disorder caused by, I mean, characterized by rather cognitive decline and memory dysfunction, caused mainly by the accumulation of extracellular plaques of insoluble large aggregates of amyloid beta and intracellular neurofibrillary tangles of hyperphosphorylated tau. But mainly, the, uh, my research is uh, focused on synapses because they are um, very important in, they have a very high, important role in the cognitive decline in Alzheimer's disease, but also other pathology. Synapses are highly specialized sites of communication between neurons. They are characterized by huge intricate networks of protein-protein interactions that are important for the maintenance of the synapses, the health of synapses. So mapping this uh, network will be important to address and solve questions about human cognition, learning, memory, in both physiological condition, but also pathological condition. And in this context, my main focus is on understanding uh, the interactors of uh, the small soluble aggregates of amyloid beta and tau ligomers that are um, considered the most toxic species in Alzheimer's disease. So, because compelling evidence are supporting the, the, the hypothesis that cognitive decline is due to the insult caused by these uh, uh, small oligomers and their interactors. But when it comes to human synapses, there is a problem, there is a limitation, let's say a limitation that is like having the availability of fresh samples or samples from living human. So, this limitation over time has led, to the, has led to the development of methods to isolate the, the synap what we call synaptosomes, which are synaptic terminal, from cryopreserved uh, tissue. Just a few words about synaptosomes. They are very important tools to use in the field, and they are detached and released synaptic terminals, which are formed in vitro. And the most the important thing of synaptosomes is that they contain both pre- and post-synaptic components. And they are metabolically and enzymatically active. So they are very used to an, and study synaptic functions in a physiological and pathological context. Considering the importance of protein-protein interaction in the maintenance of synaptic integrity, it is crucial now to develop methods to uh, investigate them in human uh, brains. So here comes the, our, the, the method that we actually um, are proposing here that is important to detect the synaptic protein-protein interaction by applying flow cytometry proximity ligation assay to synaptosomes. Proximity ligation assay, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna walk you through in deeply like later, but it's a very well used method to analyze protein-protein interaction already used for cell, uh, cells and tissues. Synflow PLA, which is the name that we gave to this method, uh, consists on, in on three uh, steps. Synaptosomes isolation from cryopreserved human brains, uh, step two is the optimization of the immunolabeling of the flow cytometry with primary antibodies. And the third step is the flow cytometry proximity ligation assay to synaptosomes. Step first one is the synaptosomes isolation. It's a very well-established method that we use in our lab because we work a lot with synaptosomes. And from uh, frozen brain uh, tissue, basically we homogenize by, the, by using a reagent available, uh, commercially available. And after a series of centrifugation, we obtain a pellet of synaptosome, with, which we resuspend with a buffer that uh, buffers that are important to maintain them healthy and active. And in, in this 
particular method, I use the SAT buffer, which is a sucrose DTA buffer, which is important to keep the synaptosomes well separated to each other. You all know I mean, <laughs> how important is this in cytomics. Every time we isolate synaptosome, we always double check the quality of our preparation, and we do this by uh, electron microscopy. And we, uh, um, um, to check the enrichment of uh, uh, whole uh, synaptosome contained the uh, presynaptic and postsynaptic component, the postsynaptic density, all the vesicle, and our preparation always look good. And uh, we also double check with the Western blot analysis, um, looking for uh, synaptic markers like NDR receptors or PSD95. And of course, we uh, analyze them at the flow cytometer. We, gate, uh, we use a gate uh, um, using the um, sides bits. Uh, so we uh, uh, design our, our gate uh, using the five forward scatter, but with the help of our manager, uh, the core facility merit uh, we also um, combined our gate with the, using the size cutter, which gave us actually even more cleaner uh, gating. Um, but here I'm showing this. So our side speed goes from 0 0.79 to 7.5 micro micrometer, but we excluded the, the smallest because it's kind of overlapping with the dead drips of the flow. And considering the size of synaptosomes that goes from 0 0.5 to 5, where the 5 can be either big synaptosomes or small aggregates, we exclude also the big one because we don't want to risk to have um, false results because we want to focus only on synaptosomes. So we gated in order to have around 1 to 5. Step 2 is very important, as also Meredith says, about the titling of antibodies because it's Basically, is the most crucial step in this whole method, because if we don't double check the quality of our staining, so the quality of the, 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 our staining first, we cannot go ahead with the PLA step. First of all, what I what we had to do was to um, optimize the condition of fixation and permeabilization of the synaptosomes, because there are no cells, they're smaller and they're more sensitive. Um, so we had to use a very mild fixation and permeabilization conditions. Then we, uh, block, we block the, so we um, block the, uh, a, specific, a specific signal using a BF, B, BSA, always everything prepared in the, the buffer that I was talking about before. And then we uh, incubated with the primary antibody, antibodies, and of course, second antibody, we analyze at the flow cytometer uh, through the use, I mean, thanks to the fluorophore, we analyze the specificity of our antibodies. Since we wanted to prove the principle of the feasibility of this technique to synaptosomes, because nobody ever done that before, we wanted to have a positive control and a negative control. Positive control for, for PLA, meaning that we need the two proteins that for sure, I mean, that are known to be interacting. And in our case, we choose PSD95 at the postsynaptic compartment with the NMD, NDR receptors, so actually 2A and 2B, two subunits of the, anti, of the receptors. There are also uh, postsynaptic and they are known to be interacting. On the contrary, our negative control uh, was uh, designed in, order, in, in a way to have a postsynaptic protein like PSD95 and as a SO2, which is not only presynaptic but also intramitochondrial. So, by definition, sh they shouldn't interact. So, what we did, we isolated the synaptosome from frontal cortex, or from human frontal cortex, and we performed the labeling using the specific antibody. And as you can see, for comparing with the, uh, the um, corresponded IgG control isotype, the uh, antibodies gave us a very nice signal, and um, both for the rabbit source antibody and also the mouse rabbit source antibody. And uh, this was confirmed also by the quantitative analysis of the percentage of positive synaptosomes <clears throat> that gave us, compared with the IgG isotype control, a very uh, higher uh, percentage. We performed the same analysis uh, using synaptosome from hippocampus, and we got more or less the same uh, trend. So we were kind of, okay, we can go ahead and we can proceed with the PLA step. About the PLA, proximity ligation assay for who of you that is not familiar with it, it's a very important and uh, kind of simple tool, even if it takes like basically all day to perform it, but it's a very good, that gives us a very good results, 
it uh, is a technique that is able to uh, identify to, that, to detect interaction between proteins that are close enough to emit this signal. How? The proteins, the two proteins of interest, that they have to be within 40 nanometer of distance. If they are farther than that, they are not going to be detected. And uh, after we incubate with the primary antibody, we incubate with secondary antibody that are conjugated with oligonucleotide, complementary oligonucleotide, that only when the proteins are close enough, they're going to form this circular DNA that then will be amplified in presence of fluorochromes, and that is the signal is going to be the one that will be detected by the flow cytometer. So what we did, basically we performed PLA on synaptosomes isolated from frontal cortex. And one important thing that we have to be considered for PLA is the, the use of neg technical negative control, which are synaptosomes in our case that, are, uh, that go through the PLA uh, um, proceed, procedure without any, any, without, the, without any antibody in the uh, solution, basically or the synaptosome with the presence of only one antibody, just to understand if there is any background fluorescence that is important to set up the threshold over the fluorescence uh, for the PLA. And in this case, as you can see here, all the negative control are on the left of the green uh, fluorescence uh, uh, axis, whereas the PLA, uh, which is that we, in this case, we analyze the interaction between PSD95 and MDR receptor 2B, which, as, as I said before, they known to interact, actually confirmed that this technique, um, through, we confirmed that through this technique that they actually, uh, we are able to detect this interaction through this method compared with all the controls. And as you can see here about the negative PLA, the biological negative um, PLA that I described before showed basically a, a percentage of positivity close, close to the neg technical negative control. We performed the same analysis on synaptosomes isolated from hippocampus, and we got more or less the same result, even though the fluorescence was a little bit lower, but higher, much higher than the controls. And so, but the controls for us was important to define that 10% that of positivity, more or less, is not everything below 10% of positivity is not safe to be considered a positive interaction. Because in our case, we proved the principle using known interacting protein, but when you want to analyze protein that you don't know, that is something that you have to keep in mind. And that's why there are limitations, if you want to say, like no limitation, but crucial point for this method is the primary antibody. As Mary before said, the titering, the antibody is crucial because we don't want to risk to have false results, negative or positive. It's important to use technical negative controls because they're they are important to gauge the baseline the PLA fluorescence and biological positive and negative controls. Because uh, to ensure, of course, there will be more samples, but that will be ensure the reliability of your results. But the strength of this method is that allows to study human synaptic protein protein interaction starting from human brain, uh, from frozen, sorry, human brains with high specificity and sensitivity using less step than other methodologies. And of course, in, in, in this case, since we're talking about protein-protein interaction, one of the main methods is the uh, IP, the immunoprecipitation. This method avoids the cross-reactivity of the antibody that we usually see, can see during IP. So in conclusion, we demonstrated the, the feasibility of a flow PLA to study protein-protein interaction within the synaptic environment. And the application of this simple method is, is, uh, will, uh, will uh, help uh, to shed light on key interactors involved in uh, uh, mechanism of synaptic plasticity, learning and memory in physiological and pathological condition like Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson disease, where and others, where uh, the progressive loss of structures and function of neurons and synapses leads to cognitive decline. With that, I want to thank, of course, my PI, Dr. Giulio Tagliatella from UTMB, and uh, my lab member, especially Dan uh, Danielle Jamison, Anna Fracassi, and Weru Zhang that actively participated in the development of this project. Dr. Aguinor Limon, also from the from uh, uh, UTMB, Meredith Wegros, uh, who is the manager of our core facility, for all, all the, the suggestion and, and advice that she gave to us, and of course our um, funding resource. And I want to thank you for your attention. And now I'm open for questions and suggestions. Thank you. Well, we have one question from online. 
Uh, someone was wondering, can they use primary antibodies tagged with oligos instead of secondary antibodies? Well, the PLA is a, is a commercially available um, map, uh, kit so that is designed in that way. I'm not sure if that can be done because um, the important the thing that, for example, I think that can be designed, but that is something that they should discuss with the company. It, over the, in this case, is the Sigma <laughs> millipore. Um, I don't see any problem on that, but right, as for now, it's not uh, available at this point. It would be great because we'll cut a little bit of time during incubation, so we shorten the, the procedure time, but as for now, it's not available. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Just briefly while I download the next talks, <laughs> um, I give a reminder that um, so this is our last session of the day, cell sorting session. It's something we did. Last year, and people really got a lot out of it. Um, and I'm sure that we will this year as well. Um, so stick with us. We have two really good talks. And then um, when I find them, and then right after that, if you stick around, you're here in person, um, you can turn in your little vendor cards. And we have all these pretty cool raffle prizes here. There's some more as well. And even if you're online, you can win a raffle prize. You just have to still be online, be logged into YouTube so that you can comment to say, yes, I'm here and I want my prize. Uh, and then we'll get your email address to send it to you. We have some gift cards right online that we can do if, if that's correct, I think. Yes, yeah, so everybody who is a virtual participant has been, your name has been entered, which means we, Sometimes that can take a while <laughs> to find it, but uh, we'll just pull a bunch of names. So, anything else? Yeah, absolutely. thank you. We did this last year and it worked well as too. So every, hopefully everyone's turned in their vendor raffles. We're gonna raffle the vendor prizes as well as one from Flotex. But if you turn in your cards at the end of it, we'll have everyone kind of pass them off to the side. I will do two raffles for in-house um, ones as well, just for just being here with your, if you turn in your badges, which I left in my car. Um, so I don't get to win, um, but no. So, so, so it worked out so well last year. So we will do, so once again, we're basically gonna raffle vendor prizes plus one Flotex for people who turned in their cards. Um, also, if you're just here, if you guys, if everyone passes their name tags to, to one side, we'll pick them up and we'll pull a prize for that as well. And then we're going to pull a prize for the virtual attendees, if that makes sense. So we want, we want to give a bunch, a couple different ways to win. Just because you didn't get the turn in the vendor sheet doesn't mean you can't get a chance to. So, all right. All right. So I have the benefit of probably introducing one of my earliest friends in flow cytometry, Evan Jelson. Um, he was lucky enough to receive his PhD from the University of Massachusetts Medical School out in Worcester. Um, he studied immune responses to viral um, infections, and then he did his postdoc training at UConn School of Medicine studying the immune tolerance in memory T cells. Obviously, he did a lot of flow cytometry throughout that experience. So now he got to stay on at UConn to become the director of the flow core there at UConn. Um, he is also very active in ISAC, um, lots of committees there. Um, he's involved in New England cytometry and uh, MetroFlow as well. So he is very active in the flow cytometry community. And he is going to talk to us about the immunology of what we're actually sorting. So some of us flow people can learn like the science behind it. So that'll be fun.
Well, thank you so much. And uh, it is truly an honor uh, to be amongst the speakers today. Thank you so much for Flotex. I'm an unabashed um, New Englander. So it's, uh, it's great that you all invited me down here to, to go over this. Um, so this lecture was originally put together as an introduction to uh, immunology, cellular immunology, not molecular, not something else. Um, so if you were sitting here during the talks uh, for the past couple of days going, what's a follicular B cell? What's a marginal zone? Uh, um, hopefully this is going to help you out. And if you already know all this stuff, then maybe what you can take away from the talk is a different way of relating um, how immunology works to your trainees and to your students as we go. So. Looks like the little thing is hidden, so that's that's perfect uh, for Zoom. Um, and so, also, uh, this is going to be a challenge because it's a uh, it's a whole course um, that basically we're going to try to jam in here uh, in the next uh, forty five to sixty minutes or so. Karen's giving me a little bit of leeway in terms of timing, uh, so uh, we're going to go ahead and do that. Um, so again, this is a course that is taught at UConn. Um, I'm one of the professors that teaches it. It's a team taught course. Um, but uh, yeah, we don't have that kind of time. So let's move along here. <laughs> all right. So not everything is going to be this black and white. All right. So um, in the interest of providing the overall concepts, uh, sometimes there has to be an oversimplification. Um, and so uh, keep that in mind. I don't want to hear arguments about you didn't talk about Tamras. OK, I get it. OK, don't be offended. It's not because I hate you. It's just. You know, we, we don't have time for that right now. Um, and so that is my big disclaimer for what we're going over today. Um, and I like to tell my students all the times, facts are right here, not facts, F-A-C-S, F-A-C-T-S, right? Uh, F-A-C-T-S are right here on your phone. Know the concept and you can look up the very specifics of everything that you're doing. Um, credit where credit is due. Um, a lot of the curriculum um, has been taken from the AAI, the American Association for Immunologists. Um, shout out to uh, UMass graduates um, on that committee there. Um, and so this is the publication that showed that. Some of it also has been taken by Isaac's own Andreas Kosariza um, in this European Journal of Immunology article guidelines for the use of flow cytometry and cell sorting in immunological studies. And of course, the textbook that we use in our course is Janeway's Immunobiology another Connecticut person, J. Charles Janeway, uh, rest in peace. Navigation for today. Um, so if you see the symbol on the right, it's gonna be mouse, it's gonna be rodent. If you see the symbol on the left, it's gonna be human. Here's the deal. Flip that around, I get it backwards. That's all right, we don't need to know left from right. <laughs> um, yeah, so left is mouse, right is human. Um, left my right, anyway, uh, it's all the same on the screen. Um, so in short, you know, humans are a terrible model for mouse immunology. That's just the reality that, that we face. Um, and again, many reagents are uh, in the humble lab mouse. Um, it's, it's a lot of what we have available. Um, and so it's a lot of what we end up studying in immunology. Why do people dislike immunology? You can all shout out reasons, but let's not do that. It's because it's an alphabet soup. It gets really confusing. Um, we love our acronyms, um, CD, TCR, BCR, TH, TC, TREG, AB, AG, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We talk about types, we talk about MHCs. There's even Greek letters, so it's not even all in English. We put the other languages in there, right? Um, but there's a few important things that you need to know about CD. These are just the proteins that we use to identify ourselves. Complementary determining is actually what it is. Um, but again, just a protein. It's something that we're looking at to identify what we're gonna actually be studying downstream. PCR, BCR, T cell receptor, B cell receptor. You might know B cell receptor as an antibody because it is exactly the same thing. Um, T helper, cytotoxic T cell, regulatory T cells. Hopefully we get to some of this stuff, time permitting. <laughs> um, antibody antigen, AB, AG. Antigens are really important. Uh, this is what your immune response is going to be against, some sort of antigen, whether that be a foreign invader, whether that be some other perturbance. It could be an autoimmune perturbance. You don't know. It could be something as simple as like damage. Your immune system will respond to that. Um, IL, interleukin, other cytokines and chemokines. These are things that our cells of the immune system will secrete um, and, and send into the environment to do various effector functions, send cells down differentiation pathways, do all kinds of fun things. There are types of immune responses. Each of these is responsible for a certain type of antigenic or pathogen response, um, whether that be an intracellular pathogen, um, an extracellular pathogen, or some sort of barrier function. 
MHC is major histocompatibility. This is really important for T cells. We'll get into that hopefully. And then of course, there's all your Greek letters. Hopefully we get to some of these as well. A lot of what happens in immunology uh, involves receptors and ligands. We just heard two wonderful talks about that. Um, and so um, cells of your immune system will have various receptors and ligands. Once those receptors and ligands engage with each other, signals are sent inside the cell and that cell will proliferate, differentiate. Maybe it just secretes something, who knows? Um, and so I like to think of this as the handshake. Um, you know, I gave this talk in Philadelphia. It was a city of love, brotherly love, and that's that's what we talked about there. Um, and I also have, uh, you know, the 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 ceiling from the Sistine Chapel there, um, uh, where they're kind of reaching out and touching each other. Um, and that's what your cells are going to be doing. Flow cytometrists, we we know this, right? We have excitation spectra, emission spectra, and at various places along these different spectra, the little arrows pointed there. You know, you have peak excitation, you have peak emission, and then things go back down in either direction. Well, you know, your immune response kind of has that a little bit as well. Um, so it starts off low, it peaks, and then importantly, by programming, it comes back down um, and those things go away. And that's because we're constantly being bombarded with antigens and different things that, that come and, and encounter us on a daily basis. If we responded to everything and it didn't go away, Frankly, that's cancer, that's not good. Um, so you end up with too many cells um, and we just can't handle it. The other hallmark is of the immune system is uh, something called memory. Um, and so just shown here, this could be cells on the y-axis, this could be cytokines, this could be you know, response, whatever you happen to want it to be. Um, and so uh, primary response is where you get the first antigen, the first insult, um, and after a little bit of time, you get a response to that. And then of course that goes away as I just described. Um, and then importantly, if you come back with that same exact antigen, that same insult, your immune response comes back and it comes back stronger and it comes back faster. Um, and that's what's shown here. Um, but importantly, if you come back with a different antigen, well, it reverts right back to that primary response, okay? Um, you know, there's a time called BC and now AC, before COVID and after COVID. I don't think many of people would have necessarily focused on this too much, but now we know. And this is why vaccines are so awesome and, and work so well. So really, when we're talking about the immune system, we might as well just start with this. This is blood, um, RBC, WBC. And your cells of the immune system, we just heard great things about RBCs, um, but the mostly what we're talking about with the immune system is the WBC, uh, the white blood cells. And shown in the lower left, did I get that right, Joel? Uh, <laughs> in the lower left uh, is a, a thin smear. Um, so this is what my hematopathologists are looking at all the time. Um, and what do we see most of? RBCs. RBCs are critical. If you're anemic, things are bad. If you don't have RBCs, you're not going to make it very long. WBCs are more rare. Um, you know, shown here is just a bunch of neutrophils, honestly. Um, but these are the ones we're interested in. We're interested in these rare cells. So we do little tricks to get rid of um, some of these red blood cells so that we can actually look at those white blood cells. Where are leukocytes? Honestly, they're everywhere. Uh, leukocytes are everywhere. Um, leukocytes, of course, meaning Lymphocytes, granulocytes, monocytes, that's a leukocyte. Um, so to begin, uh, leukocytes start off in the primary lymphoid organs. These are developmental organs. They start off in the bone marrow. They start off in the thymus. There's a few rare subsets that start elsewhere, but again, we don't have time for that right now. Um, and so we'll talk about those two primary lymphoid organs um, as we move on in the talk. Once these cells are developed, um, once hematopoiesis has occurred, they're gonna move into secondary lymphoid organs. These are just places where they reside. Um, major secondary lymphoid organs include the spleen, lymph nodes, um, pyrus patches, and the small intestine. We heard a talk about that earlier. Um, and so um, this is just where cells are going to reside. And they can move through these vessels called lymphatics, and they can also move through your circulatory system. Uh, finally, these cells may end up in tissues, especially if that insult is in the tissue. Some just reside there naturally. Um, in the tissue, they can form tertiary lymphoid structures, which is basically a de novo lymph node that occurs in, in maybe a mucosal site or somewhere else, something like GALT or BALT. Uh, again, I think that was mentioned earlier. Um, and finally, you can also find them in the blood. And, and blood, honestly, is where we, we do a lot of human immunology because it's really easy to get. You know, you can take some and look at it and hopefully it, it, it's meaningful in terms of what's happening uh, in the rest of the body. So by flow cytometry, I, I like to always tell somebody, don't forget to use the free data. It's free, it's there. Every cell has this data, right? And so we know what these are. This is forward scatter, roughly the 
shadow of a cell. I know, you know, Howard would kick my butt for saying that right now, but roughly that. Um, and the side scatter, the reflection of a cell. Um, and so if you get rid of most of the red blood cells, most of the platelets and things like that, you can identify your lymphocytes, monocytes, and your granulocytes with these two parameters alone. It's free. You don't have to add any stains. You don't have to do anything with it, right? It's there. Um, but yeah, you have that. And this is a great sanity check. If you're interested in a B cell, if you're interested in a, 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 a eosinophil, and you see that your, your B cell is up here, that's a problem probably, right? It's not supposed to be in the granulocyte area. And if you're looking at your EOs and they're down here, where'd all the granules go? Uh, that's, that's really what it comes down to. Um, and then just shown on the right, um, I think this is a bone marrow from a patient. Um, um, but this is just a convention I'm going to use. Uh, th this, this happens to be a, a lysed uh, bone marrow sample where I got rid of a bunch of the red blood cells. Um, and, and so we can see the lymphocytes here in blue because, you know, they're blue. That's what we made them. And so that's what they're going to be from now on. Uh, the monocytes will be in orange, granulocytes in green because alliteration. Um, and then finally, this blast population, which is what we're going to talk about next. But this is the convention for the rest of the talk. So if you see cells in green or orange or blue or red, um, that's what it's going to look like going forward if you see it on a flow plot. So those blast cells, what are they? Uh, we've had a number of excellent talks on this already at Flowtex, um, but these are your stem cells. These are the progenitors. These are the cells that are going to make all of the other cells of the immune system. Um, so of course, this starts at the hematopoietic stem cell, um, and this is a pluripotent stem cell, or in this case, it's not. It's a hematopoietic stem cell. Um, that This can uh, develop depending on the signals that it gets, to move towards something called a common myeloid progenitor or a common lymphoid progenitor. And then from there, you can get all of the other cells of the immune system, all of those other white blood cells. In fact, even some of the erythroid cells that we heard about. So of course, by flow cytometry, we, we've managed to identify a lot of these cells. And this was sort of how this, these schema were come up with. This is a wonderful figure that I pilfered from somewhere, DOI, blah, blah, blah. Um, and all of this information was found because we had these antibodies and these reagents and these awesome uh, pieces of equipment that allowed us to see them. Um, so just looking here at uh, bone marrow hematopoietic cells, again, primary lymphoid organ in the bone marrow, looking in rodents. Um, you can see if you look at lineage negative cells, meaning not mature, immature cells, um, and then you stain for things like CKIT and SCA1, you can find various populations that then can be distributed by other markers like CD150, CD48, uh, the IL-7 receptor, FLT3, again, these are facts. You can look these up real quick, right? Um, but the point is that each of these little gates corresponds to one of these precursors, and these precursors uh, can be identified and then further looked at. And if you happen to sort out maybe that cell right there and you differentiate it in vitro, you're going to get B cells and you're going to get T cells. Um, and that's sort of how all these things were figured out in the first place. So immunology and flow cytometry are, are linked together. They go hand in hand. Um, I think without the flow cytometer, we'd not know as much as we do about immunology. Um, for full disclosure here, um, stem cells in humans. Um, we heard a wonderful talk by Dr. Wong the other day talking about CD34 high stem cells. Um, and in fact, that's generally what's used even for stem cell transplants, formerly known as bone marrow transplants. This is literally all we look at. Are they 45-ish? Are they 34 bright? Those are stem cells, how many we got? Transfer them, go to town. That's how literally uh, medicine is practiced. <laughs> so um, that's what it is. Um, and so we can see here, they, they express some common markers. Again, CD34 high. Um, they express this other marker here called HLADR. We heard in a previous talk that that's an MHC molecule. I mentioned that very, very briefly in the beginning. Um, and also just like the mice, um, our stem cells also express CD117, also known as CKIT. Um, what to say about there. So over time, your immune response changes and the cells that are involved uh, will also be varied. Um, so early in an immune response, you may only have responses from uh, your myeloid cells or your, your uh, granulocytes. And then later in that immune response, you start to involve some of these other cells like lymphocytes that are more adaptive. Um, and so uh, this is just a way of looking at that, that you see this all happen. Um, and again, I'm gonna point back out, um, the clearance of the immune response at the very end. This is a program thing that happens um, to eliminate uh, these hopefully unneeded cells uh, as they go on. And if this doesn't happen, we, there, there gen generally tends to be problems. So in immunology, we also talk about innate and adaptive 
immune responses. Innate immune responses are those that don't require too much change to happen. They just respond. Um, there's specific signals that make it happen, but again, um, there's not much change that has to happen for that to, to, to occur. Um, so innate cells can include myeloid cells, including monocytes, neutrophils, basophils, and eosinophils, a lot of the granulocytes. Um, but also included is a, a few lymphocyte subsets, such as natural killer cells, NK cells, um, and this other subset called ILC, or innate lymphoid cell. In between, you'll note that there's a cell here called a dendritic cell that we'll talk about, and this is really a bridge between the innate and the adaptive immune response, and I'll get into why I say that. And then these adaptive cells, of course, are the other lymphocyte subsets, including B cells and T cells. Um, sometimes you'll hear about a humoral response. If you hear a humoral response, that means B cell. Um, and if you hear cell-mediated response, that generally means T cell. So now let's go cell by cell and just kind of talk about the overall concepts of what each one does. So I'm gonna start with the neutrophil. Uh, neutrophils are one of the most abundant uh, cells in circulation. Uh, they have a very, very short half-life, meaning that like every six hours, you get a new neutrophil. Um, there are three very uh, major functions for neutrophils. That includes phagocytosis. Um, very fancy word, just means eats a bunch of stuff. <laughs> okay. Um, so it ingests things like bacteria, um, and it puts it into a little vacuole that can be destroyed. So if you eat a bunch of bacteria, you want to destroy that. You don't want those things growing. Um, additionally, they can degranulate. Um, they can uh, secrete different things that will directly pop uh, foreign cells or foreign bodies that you don't want. And finally, they can explode. How cool is that, right? Um, so up in the right-hand corner, again, right, Joel, we got that. Uh, so, <laughs> um, so I have Angry Birds. I mean, this was real popular like five years ago, maybe 10. Um, and so this is the bomb bird. Um, so for those of you who don't know, you throw the bomb bird, it lands on the pigs and it explodes. That's kind of how I think about neutrophils. Um, uh, what neutrophils can do is they can undergo this thing called netosis. It's a programmed cell death mechanism where they blurt all of their DNA out. Um, and shown here is a scanning electron micrograph that's been colorized, where we have a neutrophil here in yellow, and it's puking out all of its DNA. Look at all that green stuff. That's what it is. And that DNA happens to be binding to a lot of these little purple bacteria and also happen to grab a red blood cell there. Um, so these are the three primary roles for, um, for neutrophils. Neutrophils are identified with a few different markers, again, facts. Um, so on humans, they're identified using CD10, CD15. They're also CD11B positive. All of these um, CDs uh, have a little function to them. So whether that be makes them stick somewhere or makes them go somewhere, that's what the CDs are doing. Um, and in mice, generally it's uh, CD11B and LY6G. These, this is sort of how they're, they're exquisitely identified. Um, and they can vary some of these receptors depending on how mature they are, but generally that's how we look at them. The next cell here is monocytes and macrophages. Um, in the upper right-hand corner, let me see if I can move this little talking Flotex podium thing without killing everything and shutting it off. Okay, cool. Um, so, um, so monocytes and macrophages are uh, big Pac-Man. That's, that's what they are. They go around, worker, 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 and they eat all the pills going around. And so here's a little video of a macrophage running around and eating all those little rods. Those are bacteria. If you missed it, here it goes again. All right. Um, and so that's what these things are going to do. They, they phagocytose uh, things that are around. This can include um, your foreign bodies, your antigens. Um, they also do it for dead cells. So if a cell dies, the macrophage will come along and clean that up, hopefully, right? Um, and then these things can also secrete different factors, cytokines, whatever you want to call them. Um, and then uh, kind of activate other cells of the immune system. Shown on the right is an uh, imaging flow cytometry example. Um, so above we have our green bacteria and our orange uh, macrophage. Um, and in this case, the bug is stuck on the surface. And then after some activation step or time, honestly, probably you know, temperature, uh, we can see that those bacteria have been engulfed by those uh, macrophages and now they're inside. By flow cytometry in humans and mice, it's a little bit different, um, although some of the markers are shared. Um, but monocytes are described as being classical, intermediate, or non-classical. Um, so this is uh, looking in peripheral blood. Um, and they're uh, separated based on their expression of CD14 and CD16. A couple of signaling molecules. One of them is an FC receptor. We'll get into that later, I hope. Um, but basically, it's about their function. So classical monocytes they tend to stay in circulation, then they are classically phagocytic. That's why they were called classical in the first place. And then the intermediate and the non-classical monocytes, these are more patrolling. Um, and it's thought that these can undergo extravasation and get into tissues and, and perform other specialized functions. Again, we don't have time to get into the very specifics, but um, that's basically what it is. Um, 
For mice, it's a little bit different. Um, they do express uh, CD11B, which is, I guess, similar to what, what, what happens in humans, and also this other marker, CD115, which is a receptor for uh, uh, chemocytokine. Um, uh, but these, uh, as opposed to expressing LY6G, uh, which was, again, alphabet soup, guys, alphabet soup. Um, instead of expressing LY6G, uh, these will express LY6C and they are differentiated as such. So the LY6C high monocytes are more of the classical phenotype in humans. The LY6C low are more of the patrolling or the non-classical phenotype. Um, and then, you know, there's about 100 people out there that probably argue with me about all these things, but that's the great thing about immunology. There's always more to do because we argue with each other. <laughs> Um, in addition, it depends on where you're looking, right? And so um, we talked about monocytes in the previous two slides. Uh, once these monocytes get into the tissues, they may mature into macrophages. Macro and phage means big eater. Um, and so it's a big cell that eats, wonderful. Um, and it eats a lot. Um, and so um, these can be identified at least in mice and the spleen using the marker F480. Um, they can also be, uh, recognized by CD64 expression. Um, and then uh, depending on where you look, they might be a little bit different in phenotypes. So this is taken right out of a paper um, by Lennon Lenore Hertzenberg, looking at uh, macrophages for the peritoneum. And we see uh, in the upper right hand corner, we have large uh, peritoneal macrophages. And then over here, we have the small peritoneal macrophages um, using the same marker, CD11B and F480, just a slightly different phenotype. Um, but it's important to know where you're looking you may have to switch the markers a little bit or gate a little bit differently to find what you're looking for. So as an introduction to types, um, so it'll depend on what, what, what your immune system is responding to, right? And so, um, you know, hopefully Flotex doesn't get sued by Lucasfilm or Disney at this point, but um, I've shown here a, a, a clip from uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade where um, there's a knight and he's guarding this cup. And if you choose the wrong cup, you die. Um, and so uh, if what happens is there's a character in the movie and he does choose the wrong cup and dies. Um, and so the knight says, deadpan, you have chosen poorly. Um, and so if you choose poorly, the type of immune response that you need to use to get rid of the, the insult or the pathogen, you're gonna choose poorly and it can result in autoimmunity. It can result in death in the worst cases, um, but aberrancy in general is not good. So there are three types of immune responses. Um, some would argue with me and say, hey, there's nine, there's 20. I don't, it's fine, right? Uh, again, concepts, not, not, uh, not facts. Um, but the general agreed upon three are type one, type two, and type three. Type one immune responses are specifically um, targeted towards intracellular pathogens. So this includes your viruses, this includes your bacteria, um, things of this nature. Type two immune responses, generally are um, uh, targeted against extracellular pathogens. So this is things like worms, um, other bacteria that live extra, ex, extra uh, cellularly. Um, and then type three immune responses are uh, generally thought of as barrier responses. So um, one of the slogans I, I, I always say is, you know, the type three immune response, make tight junctions tight again. Um, and so you can, you can imagine where I'm going with that. But, um, but basically the cytokines that are predominant for each of these different responses. Um, for a type one, the canonical cytokine is this thing called interferon gamma, um, which is a highly antiviral uh, uh, cytokine. Um, the canonical type two uh, cytokine is IL-4, also included in there is IL-5 and IL-13. Um, this will activate other cell types. And the canonical type three cytokine is something known as IL-17. Um, and again, that makes those tight junctions tighter, keeps those barriers uh, uh, intact. How does the immune system decide what type of immune response to generate? Um, and that is where the, uh, the current hypothesis is that these ILCs, these innate lymphoid cells start to generate these immune responses. Um, as I say here, they get the party started. Um, so there's uh, four real types of ILCs um, lumped into these are the natural killer cells, which were the first described. Um, but in addition, we have the ILC1, ILC2, and ILC3. Um, and so these are located throughout the body, either in secondary lymphoid organs or directly in the tissue or at mucosal sites. And if they are activated either through cytokine or through whatever makes them activated, again, we don't have time to get into that, they're gonna go ahead and start making other cytokines that will activate downstream effector responses. Um, getting those 
lymphocytes, T cells, B cells, whatever they happen to be, um, going in the right direction to help to clear out whatever has been uh, uh, invading the body. Because this was the first one characterized, it's also the uh, most studied, I think, of the types of ILCs that exist. Um, and this is the natural killer cell. Um, I think of natural killer cells as the comic book character Wolverine. Um, they like to go in a berserker mode. Um, they like to kill everything in sight, um, but only if they're provoked, right? Um, so, hey, I'm a Rangers fan. Hey, I'm an Astros fan. Hey, I'm a Red Yeah, so um, if you're not wearing the right flag, the natural killer cell is gonna probably try to kill you. Uh, that's, that's really what it comes down to. Um, and so they rely on a balance of activating and uh, inhibitory signals. So going back to my baseball analogy, if an Astros fan buys a beer for a Rangers fan, well, maybe they're not going to kill each other, right? Um, you're, you're just going just gonna to get along and, and move on with your day. Um, and so, so that's sort of where the, the natural killer cell resides. These cells, of course, are critical for um, surveilling for things like cancer. Um, when cancers form, sometimes uh, those cells stop wearing the right flags. They start rooting for the Astros and not for the Red Sox. Um, and so um, that causes the natural killer cell to get all excited um, and go ahead and try to eliminate that. Um, in humans, natural killer cells are identified um, as not being T cells, but are being positive for the marker CD16 um, or CD56, shown in the boxes here in red. Um, depending on the mouse strain that you look at, the natural killer cell, again, is identified as not a T cell, uh, other lymphocyte, as it were. Um, and depending on the mouse strain, again, you can use something like NK1.1, which I believe is CD161 for those of you um, CD uh, aficionados. Um, and again, these um, cells are the only cytotoxic of the ILCs, meaning they're the only cells that can kill other cells um, through uh, direct cytotoxicity or release of granules. Um, other things that you can do to test for NK cell activity is intracellular cytokine stain them. Um, and because these are more associated with a type one response, uh, what would we look for? Interferon gamma, that's the canonical type one cytokine. And so um, that's how we would look for them. So just as a recap, neutrophils and macrophages, they will encounter antigens and they'll phagocytose them. Maybe they'll release some destructive enzymes depending on the cell type that they are. The ILCs and the natural killer cells, they begin to secrete molecules, cytokines, things like that to skew towards an effective immune response. This foreign material um, by the macrophages and the neutrophils is captured and destroyed. Um, but what are these other cells doing? The B cells, the T cells, and the dendritic cells. Um, and so we're going to start with the dendritic cell. The dendritic cell is really the bridge between the innate and the adaptive immune system. So just like a, ma a monocyte or a macrophage, dendritic cells will, will uh, be in various locations throughout the body where they will pick up antigens. But instead of destroying those antigens, what the dendritic cell will do is it'll pick it up and it'll bring it out to his buddy, to a T cell, to a B cell, and hey, check this out. Look at this. What does this look like to you? Is this good? Is this bad? How's, this, how's it going? Um, dendritic cells, I like that this is my Ringo star in Octopus's Garden. Uh, dendritic cells to me look like an octopus, right? So they got all these little tentacles coming off. Maybe there's more than eight, but um, you get the idea. And what dendritic cells, again, what they'll do is they'll move to a secondary lymphoid organ um, where they'll encounter T cells or other cells, and they'll start showing, hey, look what I picked up. How's that look to you? Is that good? Is that bad? Um, so these are antigen presenting cells. They bring cells to present to other lymphocytes. Um, circulating dendritic cells can be identified um, using CD45. All leukocytes have CD45. I think I forgot to mention that like seven slides ago. Um, they're not T cells. That's what that slide shows you. Um, they're generally positive for an MHC molecule. That's how it's actually showing what it picked up to the lymphocyte. Um, through that MHC. We'll get into that a little bit more. Um, and they tend to be positive for CD11C, at least most of them. Some of them are not. Um, and for those, um, we have other markers like CD123. Um, and you know, there's a couple of different flavors of uh, dendritic cell that may perform a different function. That's really what you need to know about it. Um, that and that it will present antigen. There's several omits. We talked about a lot of omits at this meeting. Um, and these will also help you to identify dendritic cell phenotypes if you're really interested in those very specific features that I talked about, whether that be a plasmacytoid dendritic cell or a conventional dendritic cell or a migratory or et cetera, et cetera. Again, facts, not facts. Um, <laughs> you can look all that up and, and see exactly what you need, but you just got to kind of know um, what the dendritic cell is actually doing. 
So now we're going to move into adaptive cells. So we got our dendritic cells. They brought their antigens to wherever they need to be to present these things to the adaptive immune cells. And then those immune cells will carry out effective, uh, those lymphocytes will then carry out their additional effector functions. So as I described earlier on, if you're talking about a humoral immune response, you're talking about a B cell response, B cells will recognize ex exogenous antigens um, and they will differentiate um, and uh, uh, become uh, plasma cells. We will get into that as well. Um, and then T cells, of course, they recognize uh, antigens in the context of what those dendritic cells are presenting to them. Um, and there's a couple of different uh, T cell types um, that uh, we'll get into. So now it's time to introduce the central dogma of biology. Probably should have done that in the beginning, but let's get over it. So the central dogma of biology is that DNA is your template. DNA begets RNA, and RNA begets protein. So the DNA is the blueprint. Down here, we have a house, right? Um, and then from that blueprint, you maybe make a photocopy of it, bring it somewhere, give it to the carpenter, and then there you go. The, the protein is made off of that copy that you made, or the mRNA. So in general, we don't really want to mess with the blueprint. You don't want to screw up the blueprint in the first place. So, and and that'll just mess up all the proteins that you make up there and thereafter, right? So mutations at the DNA level are generally bad. Um, once again, this is tumorigenesis. This is how cancer forms. The interesting about lymphocytes, it's the only cell that screws with the DNA and messes with that original template to generate a effective immune response. Um, and that's what makes these cells so special. T cells and B cells to make their T cell receptor and B cell receptor, AKA antibody, will undergo a series of DNA recombination events to generate up to 10 to the 13th different specificities for each of these, uh, probably more than 10 to the 13th. I, I don't know the math, let's, let's be honest, but a myriad of different specificities for their receptor so that they have the ability to recognize anything that that host might encounter. Um, and so, Again, this is done at the DNA level. Pieces of DNA are chunked out of the chromosome, and then that DNA is transcribed and translated into the receptor that those cells will use to go ahead and uh, perform their effector function to recognize those antigens. Um, it's the only cell in the body that, that does this and, and keeps going. Um, and frankly, you know, maybe is why there's so many leukemias. Um, all of this relies on something known as clonal selection. What this specifically means is that individual clones with individual specificities are selected to survive from the primary lymphoid organ into the secondary lymphoid organ. And if that B cell or if that T cell happens to recognize something out there in the world, <laughs> that clone, that one B cell, that one T cell will be given a signal to divide, proliferate, differentiate, and make more of itself so that those can all go ahead and attack the foreign and, and, and antigen, um, foreign entity was what I was looking for. Um, and so that's known as a clonal selection theory of lymphocytes. Um, and as I mentioned before, um, you'll go from what's known as a naive lymphocyte. This is a cell that's never encountered its antigen before. If it gets those signals, those lymphocytes will expand to great number, and then they undergo a program contraction and silencing but the cool thing about the immune system is that once that contraction is over, you're left with a number and higher number of memory cells that have already responded to that antigen in the past. These memory cells may have epigenetic modifications. There are certainly more of them that allow those cells to respond bigger, better, faster to the next encounter with that exact same antigen. And this essentially is how vaccination works. We trick the immune system into saying, hey, make an immune response. And then when we encounter our virus, Make a bigger immune response and keep it from getting really, really bad. So we're gonna start with our B cells. B cells I like to think of as the immune archers. So shown here is, is four examples of archers. Oh, I'm hiding Katniss, let's move her. Um, so we'll get that down there. Um, so B cells have the unique ability to differentiate into a plasma cell where they can secrete their B cell receptor and send it into the lymph, send it into the circulation and, allow, and that B cell receptor can then bind to, possibly inactivate uh, foreign antigens as they come in. Um, 
And so the cool thing about B cells, in my opinion, is that the markers for um, human and mouse are really similar. Um, they all use CD19. Um, the, you know, in general, the CD markers for B cells is somewhere between CD19 and CD23. So if you're looking at any of those markers, generally it's a B cell marker. Um, and so, uh, yeah, and, and so in, in mice, um, CD19, once again, um, except now on the other axis, uh, we have this other uh, uh, canonical marker uh, known as B220, AKA CD45R. And then earlier today, we heard about uh, B1 B cells, which are, are shown here. As B cells develop, they develop in the bone marrow. Um, uh, they, they under, as they're undergoing changes from stem cell um, to early, late, large, small, pre, blah, 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 blah. They're changing up that B cell receptor, as I showed a couple of slides ago. Um, these DNA elements are being excised so that you can have these unique specificities. Um, and if you follow this um, uh, by flow cytometry means, uh, you might see that um, the B220 positive cells are negative for um, this receptor IgM. And then as they mature, they'll become positive for that. Um, there's a couple of other markers that allow you to separate what's a pre-B pre cell from a pro-B cell from a pre-pro B cell. And the B cell guys get all really excited about this, but you should just know that you can differentiate these based on their phenotype. Once the cells make it out of the bone marrow into the secondary lymphoid organs, these B cells are going to end up in uh, some sort of what's known as a follicle. Meredith and a few others have talked about follicular B cells and marginal zone B cells. And so depending on the uh, type of B cell that you're looking at, they may end up on this thing here, the edge of a, uh, of a, a lymph node um, known as the marginal zone. Um, and uh, the spleen is kind of like in a similar fashion. Um, and these B cells are kind of there filtering out the lymph fluid as it comes in or filtering out blood as it comes through it. Um, and these are more of an innate like B cell. They have similar specificities. They maybe don't undergo as much DNA swapping out. Um, and then those that are in the follicles, these are the B cells that are going to, um, again, they're still filtering things out, but these are the ones that are undergo additional changes, undergo additional um, clonal expansions um, and really respond uh, to the uh, pathogen that's coming in by either turning into a memory B cell or a plasma cell. Um, and so what's happening in that B cell follicle? Well, um, the B cells are coming in um, and that dendritic cell, remember the dendritic cell? It's actually, there's a, a couple of very special dendritic cells that actually will present antigens to those B cells. And those B cells will once again, change their DNA a little bit. Um, and it does this at random. So it already can respond to the antigen, but it's trying to make itself a little bit better. And so it does that by mutating its DNA. Sometimes it goes well and it keeps on going. Sometimes it doesn't go so well. And those ones that it doesn't go so well, those are tagged to die. Those move on, they, they die by neglect. Um, if they receive certain signals from other cells that we'll talk about in three slides, hopefully, um, then they'll continue on, they'll proliferate and differentiate. Um, and maybe they'll become long-lived plasma cells or maybe they'll just go on to become uh, memory B cells. And so uh, this is an active area of study um, in various uh, uh, laboratories throughout the world. Um, in addition to all of these other mutations I just went over, the B cells also have the ability to do this thing called class switching. And that is where, so we all know that anybody probably, right, that has a business end at the top here and then has this other end down here that we don't really think about. Well, this other end has very specialized functions and it can carry out various effector functions. Um, and the signals that a B cell gets will allow uh, that B cell to make a decision between B secreting something called IgM, um, IgG, IgE, or IgA. Um, and that will all depend upon other lymphocytes that T cells, we'll talk about that momentarily, um, or uh, other cytokines such as uh, IL-4, IL-5, interferon gamma. Maybe you've heard of these in the past. But the main thing here is that, so I, I relate this back to our students about, it's a specialized function, right? So I, as I already said, th these are the immune archers. They're gonna release their arrows. But you can see Katniss, she has one arrow and it's very specialized. And then Carrie L's here from Robin Hood, he has five arrows. So that has five little points on it, right? And then Hawkeye, well, I don't know if you saw Avengers, but Hawkeye has arrows that explode. I mean, that's pretty cool, right? And so depending on what class switch you make, you may have one of these specialized functions that allows you to carry out. Maybe explosion's not on that list, but you know, certainly it's a different, different specialized function. Um, 
And so, of course, class switch recombination can also be monitored by flow cytometry. I think, honestly, Meredith already showed this plot. Um, and you can identify all of the different um, uh, expression of IgD, IgM, IgG, IgA um, using various uh, anti-antibody antibodies, which is, which is fun to think about, really. Um, and so finally, um, we're going to go back into that follicle, and we're going to talk about something called the germinal center. And again, this germinal center is where there's more uh, mutation happening to really tune those B cells to be hyper-specific. I mean, really, really good at uh, binding to foreign antigens. Um, and so uh, this is happening, um, uh, again, at, at the individual clone level. Um, and so shown here is a number of different B cell follicles um, in a, like a, what's called a rainbow mouse, where every single different color represents an original B cell that has switched a little bit. Um, and then up here is our, you know, our old tried and true flow cytometry, um, looking at our germinal center B cells based on something called peanut and glutenin, um, CD95, AKA FAST, or the marker that we heard about earlier, GL7. And so, um, you know, the last thing that I, I circle here are uh, memory B cells and plasma cells. And of course, this is the long-term uh, hope of uh, an effective B cell response. Um, and so how do we identify those by flow cytometry? In humans, it's, um, there's a number of different markers, including CD138 and CD38. Um, these are what are used to identify plasma cells, either in bone marrow um, or in other tissue sites. Um, and then uh, in mice, it's a little bit different. Uh, generally, it's just CD138 that's agreed upon uh, as the plasma cell marker. For memory B cells, um, in humans, they're a little bit easier to identify. Generally, those that are CD127 high and negative for IgD, which is the original um, class of antibody that is produced by a B cell, um, are agreed upon to be the memory B cells. Um, and you can read the disclaimer here that the consensus of agreement on identification of B cells is um, and that's just because B cell guys like to argue with each other, I suppose. Um, so now we're gonna move on to T cells. This is the other lymphocyte. Um, and this is um, all part of the cell mediated immune response. Um, there's two major types of T cell. There's your CD4 T cell, and, and we think of these as helper T cells, and then the cytotoxic CD8 T cells. The CD antigens that we use to identify T cells are basically number one through number eight. That's basically the, the ones that if you, any of those, probably a T cell marker. Um, and these are the wrestlers. These are the cells that go, you know, cell by cell and check things out and make sure everything's cool. Um, I also have the postal service there because they deliver packages. Maybe it's a cytokine package. Maybe it's a, you know, a death cell, death signal package. Who knows? Um, in addition, they're like the TSA. Um, so they're checking everything. They're checking everybody's boarding pass. And they're making sure that you're getting on the right flight, that you have the right information, that you don't have something that you're not supposed to have uh, before you get on that plane. And then finally, the A team, Mr. T. No, everyone's, uh, you're all got blank faces. Come on. Uh, anyway. Uh, um, so in humans, um, T cells are identified uh, using CD3. Um, this is a piece of the T cell receptor. Uh, if it's a helper T cell, it's going to be CD4 positive. Um, and if it's a killer T cell, it's going to be CD3 uh, positive. They also tend to uh, doubly express CD2 and CD7. Mouse is not that different. CD3 is the same, CD4 and CD8. Um, and then certain flavors of T cells, again, we're not getting too deep into these things, um, may express different um, things like L-selectin or CD44. And this just tells you if that T cell has seen an antigen before, or if it hasn't, or if it's supposed to live in a lymph node, or if it's supposed to be running around circulation. Some people call it central memory and effector memory and get all excited, but that's really what it's telling you. T cells develop in the thymus. Um, you know, if, in short, uh, if you come to my, my lab, we have a little thing on all of our Macintosh computers. Hopefully IT is not listening. And it says, uh, the password for this computer is the T-cell developmental organ. And so if you don't know that the thymus is the T-cell developmental organ, you're not getting into this computer. That's, that's the reality. Um, but in the thymus, the T-cells, like the B-cells in the bone marrow, are going to undergo that gene rearrangement, that DNA editing, um, to make a good T-cell receptor. And that T cell receptor will then be used, um, again, with its myriad of uh, uh, specificities. Um, there's a number of different markers that you can see in the thymus. Um, CD4 and CD8, you get the airplane plot where the naive or the, 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 sorry, the immature T cells are double positive or double negative. And then as they mature, they'll become single positive for eight or four. Um, 
And then over here, um, I had to edit this. This is actually a Nature article where they had a typo. Let's not go there. Um, but if they express various levels of CD25, which is a cytokine receptor, or CD44, which is, again, a sticky receptor, um, you can follow them throughout their development and see uh, uh, you know, how development is going. Um, but these are the canonical markers, at least in mice um, and in humans. T cells, however, unlike B cells, B cells, they're antibody, their B cell receptor sticks to anything and everything. You can make it stick to a sugar. You can make it stick to a protein. You can make it stick to, I don't know, a bead, I guess. Um, you, you can make those stick to whatever you want it to. T cells, on the other hand, they need something. They need this thing called MHC, major histocompatibility. Um, they cannot recognize things just willy-nilly. The antigens, they're, they're kind of fancy, right? They need it served to them on a, on a nice plate. Um, and that nice plate happens to be MHC. Um, what do they recognize in general? It's peptides. Um, and so there's these little fragments of proteins that will be presented by dendritic cells. Maybe they're also presented by B cells. There's a few specialized cell types that can present them. Um, and they will present this MHC to the, the MHC molecule to the T cell. And that T cell um, will undergo a series of uh, cytoskeletal changes and things like that that we can examine by flow and imaging cytometry, um, where you get this, this, this synapse, just like we just heard about in, in neurobiology, right? Where the antigen presenting cell and the T cell are really stuck together and engaged with each other. This is that handshake that we talked about very early in the talk. And depending on the MHC that you are given to the T cell will uh, make a difference on what that type of T cell is. So CD4 T cells will always recognize MHC class two. And CD8 T cells will always recognize MHC class one. By the way, that was a total lie. Sometimes things go wrong. At any rate, um, but this is how we identify what's happening. MHC class two generally presents things that were taken from the environment, grabbed here, there, and everywhere. MHC class one, that presents things that came from within the cell. So if a protein is made inside a cell and it's wrong, MHC class one will stick that on the surface and show it to a T cell. So if a virus gets in a cell, and it makes a protein, that MHC class one molecule maybe will bind to that protein and stick it on the surface where the T cell can recognize it. This is just the overall pass pathway for MHC class one and MHC class two processing. Way too advanced for what we're talking about today, but in short, there is a whole series of steps that have to occur to make this fold properly and get to the surface. Um, and this is basically what I just said. And so for MHC class two, those, um, MHCs are presented to CD4 T cells. And those CD4 T cells are known as helper T cells. So here we have the, uh, the beetles, um, help. Um, and so CD4 T cells are termed helper uh, T cells because of the help that they provide, the cytokines that they provide to other immune cells um, in, the, in the body. Um, we could go over all of the varied uh, Th1 type one, Th2 type two, Th17 type three. Um, there's a number of different subsets of T helper cells that can be put out there, and they all come back to the type of cytokine or help that they provide. Um, the other ones, that, the only ones besides TH1 and TH2 that I'm really going to point out today are this one down here called TFH. That is a T follicular helper. These T cells reside in that B cell follicle, and they present, uh, uh, they, they uh, accept the presentation from B cells, give signals to those B cells to say, hey, B cell, you're good you should uh, mutate some more and proliferate. Um, and the other one I'm gonna talk about is the Treg. Um, these are T cells that just say, whoa, stop, 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 stop. Um, and these may be involved in some of the silencing of the immune response that we talked about, um, but uh, those are the major ones. Um, Th1 cells, um, again, they will activate things like macrophages, cause them to lyse those things that they've eaten. Um, something like a TF follicular helper cell I literally just described. Um, these are ones that are going to activate B cells in the follicle. Um, and so this is just showing here in red on the left, uh, we have a number of uh, red bacteria. And in the right plot, we can see after those T cells have uh, been activated, those bacteria are all are lysed um, in that macrophage population. Um, to identify these, once again, we have to do things like uh, intracellular cytokine stain or transcription factor analysis. So whether we're looking for a Th2 cell by IL-4 intracellular cytokine stain, a Th1 cell by interferon gamma intracellular cytokine stain, or a Th17 by IL-17 or perhaps IL-22, 
Um, these are just how we identify those, help, those helper T cells. Oftentimes we have to stimulate these cells to make them make these cytokines. In addition, we have the transcription factors and these can also send them down these various pathways. Um, in addition, we can also identify things like memory cells. Um, I'm not gonna get too far into this again, um, but these can be identified using various chemokine receptors. Um, and again, this is all published data. Um, finally, the T regulatory cells. Um, again, these are the ones that say, whoa, stop. There may be too much immune, cell, immune, immune response happening. Let's slow everything down. Um, and there's a very myriad of ways that these cells can do that, including the secretion of TGF-beta or IL-10. Generally, these cells in humans, you can identify with surface markers such as IL-7 receptor or lack thereof, and uh, positivity for CD25. In mice, unfortunately, um, we're relegated to looking at uh, transcription factor. The canonical one in this case is FOXP3. I think we heard something about that earlier today as well. Um, cytotoxic CD8 T cells, these are killer T cells. Um, so much like an NK cell, these cells, once they engage MHC and peptide, they will go ahead and secrete various granulo, granulo, granulitic granules um, to uh, kill the cell that it has just encountered. Um, once again, these are uh, identified using things uh, like intracellular cytokine stain, in this case for uh, the cytokine TNF-alpha and interferon gamma. Um, we heard about these yesterday. Um, in addition, we can also directly uh, look at um, their ability to lyse target cells in various in vitro and even in vivo methods with flow cytometry, where you transfer um, uh, various targets and watch them disappear. Um, to identify antigen experience in naive cells, um, uh, in general, uh, there's, again, these sticky molecules like CD44 and CD62L uh, that we talk about. And so if you ever see T central memory or T effector memory, this is sort of what they're talking about. Where are they located? Where do they tend to hang out? And what are they going to do? Each of these phenotypes may have a special, specialized um, function um, that, that will help uh, clear a pathogen. And how do we identify our antigen-specific T cells? Um, and so, as I told you before, there's up to 10 to the 13th different possibilities. How do we even find these things, right? Um, and so one way that we, we can do that is through the use of MHC class one or MHC class two tetramers, or um, in, um, uh, to acknowledge uh, Stephen Haley, um, dextromers, um, sponsor of the conference. Um, and so these are uh, MHC, uh, synthetically made MHC molecules with the peptide on board that allow you to see the antigen specific T cells. Um, unfortunately, antibodies aren't always available for these sorts of things to identify them. So we use these Tetramer reagents to do so. Um, and then finally, um, these T cells can be um, identified for their various potential to become memory or stay as effector cells um, with a number of different markers. This has been uh, work from uh, various researchers, um, including Susan Keck, Rafi Ahmed, um, Leo LaFrancois, others, um, where um, you can see uh, the differentiation pattern of these T cells over the course of an infection by their expression of the IL-7 receptor and this uh, killer lectin receptor G1, which um, identifies them as, hey, this one might be better off being a memory cell, and uh, this, one, this one's going to die at the end of the immune response. That's really what that's showing. So an overview of everything I just talked about. Congratulations, you all made it. Um, uh, so, so the one thing I will point out is that this is an orchestra. It's, it's, a, it's a balance. It, it, it's a well-coordinated uh, system where all of these things play in concert. And if you eliminate one thing, you perturb the system and maybe you don't get an immune response. And never was that more evident um, than what we just saw in the past few years with COVID, where if you didn't generate an effector, a good effective TH1 T cell response, you were probably not going to have a really good time with COVID. You're probably going to have some, some long-term sequelae. Um, and so that is that. Again, thank you all for bearing with me. We went through an entire course in 54 minutes. <laughs> um, this is me. This is my contact information. You can see I had darker hair back then, um, and I'm happy to take any questions.
no online questions, Evan, except that uh, you now have a couple offers to come and speak for people in their flow cytometry labs to give the same lecture. <laughs> so the whole course in, in 50 minutes, wow. <laughs> yeah, well, you get better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, you know, the, like it's like auctioneer training, um, and so maybe I, maybe I picked that up in New England. Um, <laughs> anyway, yeah, this is a great overview, Evan. Thank you so much. Um, just to clarify, I don't know if I understood correctly. You were saying in mouse uh, regulatory T cells, you don't use CD twenty five, CD one twenty seven to to identify them, just FOXP three. Um, so in general, CD twenty five positive is definitely T reg, but mm -hmm. not all CD twenty five positive T cells in CD four T cells in mice are T reg. Right. Um, the naive T cells can be CD twenty five positive as well as certain other activated states. And so the one twenty seven by CD twenty five doesn't quite work. And so the one that's universally agreed upon <laughs> is the transcription now. factor standing for <laughs> Fox B three. Okay. Um, and so again, with the caveat of universally agreed upon. Um, because I'm sure someone will be like, well, what about the getters? The getter done. I don't know. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah so there, there's arguments on everything. Again, nothing is this black and white. Probably my Pinocchio. Knows Hello. Hey. I also teach immunology back at home. So Great. my, um, just for clarification, uh, can you um, explain regarding the MHC cross presentation by dendritic cells? Yes. Yes. So, so what she's referring to is there are occasions where an extracellular antigen can come into a dendritic cell, be passed from the vacuole that came in into a compartment that contains MHC class one. So there are occasions where you can have extracellular peptides or proteins that get presented on MHC class one. And that's known as cross presentation. That, that's the term that's been, uh, that's been described. Um, there's other, even more, shall we say, interesting things that can happen. One of them is called cross-dressing, and that's where a dendritic cell will rip an MHC from another cell and put it on its own surface. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of these different things. Um, if you start going down some of these rabbit holes, um, yeah, you really get confused sometimes, and, and you really got to look at the subtleties. But cross-presentation is something that can happen. It's actually more common um, than I'm probably letting on. Um, and again, that's where you can get extracellular peptides presented on an intracellular peptide presenting MHC class one. And it's uh, unique only to dendritic cells or other cells also can do that? Um, so as soon as I say, yes, it's unique to dendritic cells, there's going to be 15 PubMed articles that say, no, it's not unique to dendritic cells. So I'm not going to commit to one way or the other on that one. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Uh, in a, regarding to that, can you share your thoughts how uh, proteins from extracellular vesicles are presented, cross-presented? So like EVs. Yeah. Yeah. So EVs, um, you know, we've been kind of ignoring for, um, you know, in one of my slides, we, taught, we, we showed a, the low forward scatter and low side scatter stuff that we kind of ignore. Um, but honestly, to me, I, I think EVs are, are, are the envelopes of the immune system, of the body, okay? And so what does an EV have on it? It has an address and it has a, something inside. And so it, in my opinion, this is how cells are signaling to each other over long distances. I mean, we used to call these hormones and things like that. But realistically, I think most things are probably going to be associated with EVs um, than just free-floating. Um, I'm actually even wondering now if these chemokines and cytokines that I'm telling you about, if these are all EV associated and we just haven't really looked hard enough. Um, and so, yeah, super important, nascent field. Um, that's why, you know, flow cytometry and, and looking at these extracellular vesicles and getting the tools and the equipment to be able to look at these extracellular vesicles is going to be absolutely critical um, going forward. Yeah. Thank you. Hopefully that's enough. Yeah. Lot. As many people have noted, that is just a ton to, to pack into 55 minutes. Um, very impressive. So we've made it now to the, to the final talk of the day. And I think those of you who've stuck around will be very happy you did. Um, the next speaker is Dr. Karen Fleiss Dwyer. She was, it gave such a popular talk last year on cell sorting that uh, it got posted as its, as its own whole separate thing. And um, She's been invited back. So uh, 
Perrin earned her PhD at the University of Wisconsin-Madison where she studied B lymphocyte deficiency and then did a postdoctoral fellowship at the Trudeau Institute in Sarnac Lake, New York where she studied T cell function and aging. So she's got the whole gamut of the adaptive immune system under her belt. Um, she's currently the director of the UT MD Anderson Advanced Cytometry and Sorting Facility. She's been there since 2008. She's an associate professor in the departments of hematopoietic biology and malignancy and stem cell transplantation. And she's been a professional cytometrist for over 20 years. Although that's crazy because you're like 21, right? Um, so uh, her research at MD Anderson focuses on single cell analyses and leukemia. She is the past president of Flotex. She's been a member of the Flotex organizing committee since it was formed in 2007. And she's also like the best mentor in the world, a very good friend and a uh, great person. So please uh, take it away, Karen. Thank you. Um, so I'm a little bit too short for this podium, so you'll just have to get used to looking at my forehead. Um, anyway, I had a talk, as Sarah mentioned last year, about cell sorting. And my concept here is to talk about, um, because my core lab does cell sorting for scientists across the entire spectrum of cancer research and other types of research that happened in MD Anderson, and we sort all kinds of different cells, I think I've seen a lot of things that people don't consider up front that impact their sort product and their sort results. And um, if you don't consider the problems that you might run into up front, as we all know, you're going to run into those problems and you're going to redo your experiments. So, okay, so the rationale for this sort is that sorting is critical in lots of different kinds of experiments. You would not be, you'd be amazed by the number of types of experiments and papers even that get published where sorting was done but does not appear in the methods. Um, it just is a very common technique and required for all kinds of different things. It has a time pressure component though. Unlike flow an analysis, if you get good flow data recorded, you can do a lot of messing with that data and reanalyzing that data and really working it until you have excellent results. If you make bad decisions on the sorter, you can't fix that because you've already put your cells through the sorter. Um, you, so those rapid decisions need to be made by the researchers while the cells are healthy and while they're in a single cell suspension. These things are a little bit in tension where the cells are usually not at their happiest in a cell suspension. Um, so your choices here will impact the quality of the sort product and the success of your downstream experiments. I never talk about sorting without first pointing out that sorting is an especial biosafety hazard. Um, it's best done in core laboratories in my opinion. Uh, cell sorting is um, an aerosol hazard. It produces aerosols during a clog, typically. Um, so if the sorter is running well, it's not producing aerosols. It's not terribly hazardous. But once there's a clog, um, you're going to get aerosol particles that are, are clouds that can be visible, actually. And um, these particles will be about 50 to um, 500 nanometers. So they're perfect size to get really deep down in your lungs. Um, aerosol containment on a cell sorter needs to be validated routinely. Your sorters should be in biosafety cabinets. They should be in separate rooms and with negative air pressure and all your staff needs to be trained on the SOPs and use respirators where needed. There should be a project level risk assessment to determine what safety levels, what precautions need to be taken. Um, a very quick overview of how cell sorter works. It's a pressurized system typically. It pushes um, the it pushes uh, sam sample or pushes PBS from the sh pressurized sheath tank up into the top of the instrument where there's a hydrodynamic, hydrodynamic focusing through the flow cell and um, the cells will start to line up in single cell, um, in a single cell order up here. Then there's a nozzle with a drop drive, which is usually about a 70 micron to 140 micron aperture. Um, the cells need to pass through that. At that point, they'll um, be interrogated by laser beams. They'll all be lined up nice and tight. There'll be a stream. And then this drop drive here is a hydro, um, it's a, what do you call that? Uh, sorry, it's a chip. It basically shakes the stream slightly and um, provides uh, droplets that form at a known position. And uh, those droplets will contain or not contain cells and pass through charge deflection plates where 
cells that have particular fluorescence um, properties can be deflected in multiple directions into collection devices. Um, cells that are not of use to you can will all go into the waste, and that will go directly into the waste tank, which is typically full of bleach and not recoverable to you. So once you've failed to sort something, you're not getting it back. I always tell people the quality of your sort preparation if you're using a core is the, the single highest um, factor in the success of your experiment. Your cell suspension needs to be smooth. The cells need to be not aggregating. They need to be well dis dispersed in suspension and able to be hydrodynamically focused so that they don't clog that small aperture, the nozzle on the sorter. Um, so your single cell suspension should generally be filtered through a 40 micron mesh um, before you put it on the sorter. Once you do put it on the sorter, the break off, which is this place where the drops that are forming from um, the drop drive are starting to be disconnected. That last connected drop needs to be in a known place so that you can run um, a charge down the stream and charge the correct drop to put it into your collection tubes. Um, you should also be watching that your, as well as your stream break off not moving, there's always a camera that'll show you an image like this where the drop off, the break off is shown. Um, that is a strobe camera. So if you see any movement in that, you're, you're in a bad place and you need to take your sample off. Your event rate should stay sample, uh, stable during sorting. So you don't wanna be doing, you know, 5,000 one second and 10,000 the next second. That's a good indicator that there's something wrong with your cell suspension that you're gonna to need to vortex, um, refilter, and um, get that to run smoothly. Uh, one of, a couple of things you can do to prevent your cells from aggregating is to use a low concentration of protein. I usually recommend about 2% FBS or if you prefer 0.5% BSA. Um, and a two millimolar EDTA can inhibit calcium dependent aggregation. Um, so all of these things here are the um, negatives that are going to cause clumps and aggregates and cause problems with your cell sorting. So again, don't clog the cell sorter. Um, once you do clog the cell sorter, um, you end up with clouds of aerosol that are parts of cells and fragments of cells and potentially fragments of aggregated, aggregated clumps of cells or tissue debris that sticks together. All of this aerosol spray gets into your collection tubes. It also gets into the room air. It's um, gonna contaminate your sort products. It's gonna cause biosafety problems and it's probably gonna ruin your experiment. Uh, clearing a clog in and of itself can be done by a skilled operator. Um, however, it can change some of the um, intensity of your parameters. So the big, biggest thing you can do is to prevent a clog in sorting. Um, we do see this as a frequent thing in a lab that runs a lot of sorting. Um, we do get a lot of clogs and it's not a good sign for the outcome of your experiment. Always start with a good quality sample and a clean sorter and filter your samples before loading and hopefully this doesn't happen to you. For cell sorting, um, to set up your experiments, you're going to bring all the same kinds of controls that you bring for every kind of experiment. So you're going to bring your unstained cells, your unstained beads, your single color controls. Um, I like comp beads. Uh, a lot of people will tell you cells are better. There's argument to be had there. Do not forget that your viability stains also need a single color control. You might need gating controls like FMOs, where you've added all your antibodies except one, and you certainly might need biological controls like your parental cell line that doesn't have GFE, um, wild type cells that have a more normal um, phenotype, as well as things like normal PBMC or similar tissue that um, you can use to help you identify where populations are in a cleaner sample than you're actually gonna wanna sort for your real experiment. Um, a couple of tips for how to stain your cells. You do need to keep your cells while you're staining in the smallest volume that is reasonable. So um, classically people say um, for analysis about a million cells in a hundred microliters with your antibodies is where you wanna be. For cell sorting, you can get down to five to 30 million cells in a hundred microliters. This really depends on your cell type, how big it is, but you wanna keep that volume as small as possible so that you get good proximity between your antibodies and your cells. Your antibody titers um, are usually based on weight or volume per 100 microliters of staining. And you, should, you can titer for cell sorting, but you need to use a lot of cells. So 
there are some rules of thumb where if you are at 5 million per 100 microliter, you probably do not need to increase your titer from what you would use for analysis. But once you pass 10 million per 100 microliter, you're going to need to double or triple the amount of antibody that you add. Um, if you're staining with DNA dye or another protocol, always consider that um, your cell numbers are often higher and you need to optimize those um, protocols. So for lots of other tips on sample preparation, refer to my Flotox 22 talk. Um, that was a little quick reminder of some of it to give you background on this talk. It's posted up on YouTube and Sarah said some very nice things about it, so maybe you'll like it too. Okay, so um, a cell sorting experiment um, or an experiment that includes cell sorting can be an exhausting process. You're potentially, you know, taking down a large number of animals and spending a lot of time preparing those tissues to run through a sorter. Um, you, you'll end up with a busy day in many cases. So we understand that it's hard to be on time, um, but it is important that you are keeping the core informed of that. It's also important that you try to not miss steps along the way. If you bring samples to a sorter and they are not stained properly or not prepared properly, you may not be able to proceed. So advanced planning that you can do is to first consult with your core because your core will know their instruments and they'll know something of your biology. Make sure you have all your reagents in stock. I shouldn't have to say that, but the number of times people come to me and they say, I need to sort using this and I don't have it yet. Can I replace yours? Well, I don't have every reagent in the world either. So I probably can't help you. Write out a protocol, basic science stuff, outline the controls that you're gonna run and then run a pilot a small scale pilot before you run your experiment. You can set up your gating strategy, you can make sure your panel's working, you can identify all the roadblocks that you might need to do. Don't use the time to run the sort to optimize the sort. Um, in any sorting experiment, you're gonna make, need to make decisions quickly based on what you see on the machine at that time. So the more information you have up front, the better. Um, the other question I get all the time is how many cells and how much time do I book for a sorter? So how many cells do you need for your downstream application is the first thing you want to ask yourself. And what's the frequency of the cells that you want to sort? This should tell you about how many cells that you want to bring to the sorter. In general, you want to bring probably about one and a half to two times that many because there's loss in any preparation, including cell sorting. Um, once you know how many cells you want to bring to the cell sorter, you need to determine with your core what's the maximum vent rate that you can or should run with your nozzle and um, drop, uh, drop drive frequency. Once you know those, that'll help you estimate the time that the sort would take. Um, always you want to consider the optimal cells per mil um, to bring to the sort. Um, if your cells are very dilute, they will sort very slowly. We cannot keep them lined up and just increase the core size by turning the instrument up. Um, if you have a lot of cells that you need to sort, consider setting it up in parallel on multiple sorters at a big institution and running all of them sorters in the same time block to complete your needs. Okay, so you've gotten to the sorter. What do you do now? Okay, so a lot of times people look at final figures in papers and they look at cytometry and they say, oh, I want to isolate that cell type. Well, most papers are only going to publish the last few plots of what you're actually going to do. So in sorting in particular, it's very important that you use single cell gates unless you have a reason that you don't use single cell gates. If you don't include single cell gates, you get effects like this, where if you have a reasonable scatter gate and you have CD4 and CD8, you end up with about 10% of your cells that look like CD4 or CD8 positives. Now, that's a little bit of a topic in science right now, but probably you don't want the wrong ones. If you're going to study cells that express CD4 and CD8, you should make an effort to be sure that they're not just two cells stuck together. Um, these single cell gates are ba based on the raw pulse. So they're the height and width of the raw pulse of fluorescence data. Or, um, and in a single cell, that will have a, a height that is proportional to the area. And in a doublet cell or a coincidence event, it will have an increased uh, with or area relative to the height. So you can see you can get rid of, um, in this sample, about 10% of the events um, by doing this. And um, we usually use two cell, uh, single cell gates, one for forward and one for side scatter. We do that just to, for extra um, safety. 
once you've done that, it's not perfect. There's probably still a few CD4, CD8 double positives. Maybe these are biologically interesting. You need to do more work in your system, but don't start with these guys where we know they're not real. Viability staining is extremely important in sorting. If you sort dead cells and mix them with your live cells, it doesn't generally keep your live cells happier. Um, you can't exclude scatter, uh, dead cells with just scatter gates. And dead cells have very unexpected fluorescent signals. So once they start to die, a lot of metabolites and things within the cells will change and you'll get unfluorescent signals. They'll become stickier. They'll stay, stick to your staining reagents. Um, we like viability dyes that are DNA dyes that are excluded from the membrane. Um, you can use immune reactive live dead set, um, stains, which are common now for analysis. But what you have to remember about these is that unlike the DNA dyes, um, which are testing at the time that you acquire four cells that are have an intact membrane. Um, immune reactive dyes are testing at the time that you stain. So if there's an interval between there, you could have dead cells that you're not catching here. Um, also, the, the, the nuclear dyes tend to be foolproof, uh, whereas the immune reactives, you've got to get the titers right. Uh, so don't forget that you need a single stain for that. And if you have very low viability, you might want to consider something like calcine AM. Um, calcine is available in a couple of different colors. It needs to, um, in order to be fluorogenic, it requires the cell to be viable. So it's the only thing that lights up live cells instead of lighting up dead cells. Always easier to tell something or to identify consistently something that's positive than something that's negative. So examples of this, this is a relatively complicated sort that somebody in my lab was doing for um, INKT cells. And what we found was that if he forgot his viability stain, you ended up with a larger um, population of tetramer positive. This is the INKT tetramer. Um, and you end up with a variability in their forward scatter. And certainly you're putting dead cells into that collection too. This all eases up once you've added a live dead stain. You get a more clear gating. All of your gates all the way through are less messy, and you're going to be able to identify the positions for those more clearly. All of these cleanup gates are important, so don't just pick one. Pick as many as you can. I'm showing you here um, a CD3 versus 11B. I believe this is, uh, this is not blood. This is some kind of tissue sample. It might be mouse tumor. Um, and what we're looking at here is what the CD3 and CD... Uh, CD3 and CD11B populations look like when you only use some of the cleanup gates. So the scatter gate only, you can see that we're getting this tail of probably doublets here. Um, we've got a lot of stuff here. We add the singlet gate, this comes down a bit. We add the live gate and viability is clearly a huge issue in this sample. We lose a lot of this and we get a nice clean separation of our CD3s. We add a CD45 gate, it just gets better. We add all four of our cleanup gates, all of this gets cleaner, and we're going to be able to gate those populations more accurately and give you the product and the number of cells that you expect to get back. Um, anytime you can use two fluorescence parameters to separate rare target populations, you should do that. Um, in this case, it's a very simple thing. This is using um, GFP and DAPI, a live dead stain, um, for, uh, for identification of GFP positive cells. And what you can find is that you have these cells here that are sort of, they're not dead, but they're not happy, right? And if you use your control here and you gate first on forward scatter versus GFP, you get this sort of, I don't know where to put my gate, right? There's some stuff here that I, if I had a viable sample, I could probably drop this gate down. If I look at that GFP versus my live dead marker, I get a nice clean line where I'm using the autofluorescence and the live dead stain to determine where my GFP positives are, and my sort product is going to be better as a result of that. Uh, another example of using two fluorescence parameters, this is a very messy sample. I believe it's a liver sample, um, a liver tumor sample, and what we are finding here is that um, we had a situation where the live dead uh, stain, and this was an amine reactive live dead, didn't work very well. Probably they didn't get enough stain onto the cells because they're following the manufacturer protocol, which is written for analysis and not for this many cells. And when we looked at their Ly6C, where they wanted to sort Ly6C positives, what we saw was that 60% of our cells that came through this gating process were Ly6C positive. Now, 
I don't know of any biology that would cause a mouse liver tumor to be 60% monocytes, so I was dubious about this. I had them go back and restain this sample with CD11B, and look at that. We got a predictable 1%, nice, clearly defined Lie6C um, CD11B double positives. That's the population you want to sort because otherwise you've really just purified some junk. You've increased the purity, but you haven't purified. Also remember to set gates stringently. Um, every time you have a histogram for anything, uh, if there is not a complete separation between the two peaks, if the peaks do not hit back at the axis, there is this what I call zone of uncertainty, right? These are all a curve fit, right? So there is the negatives that come out this way and the positives that come back this way. All this stuff in here is a mix of positives and negatives. So keep your sort gates away from that area. In this case, if I were just sorting this population, I'd want to be out here sorting the positives, out past that zone of interest. Oh, now we're on the next slide. So anyway, um, just keep in mind that, that we want to make sure that we're not trying to get everything, we're trying to get what you're actually sorting. Um, lineage gates for rare populations are extremely important. Um, this is an example of what uh, the sorting of monocytes, non-conventional, um, intermediate and conventional monocytes, um, looks like when you don't use a lineage gate in a CLL patient. And what we can see is that these are messier. We have a lot harder time determining where the separation is here on CD14 versus 16. When we use that lineage negative gate, we've cleaned this up a lot, and these populations pop out a lot better. There's a lot less unnecessary stuff in there. So if you're looking for rare populations, or if you have a tumor sample that has a lot of tumor cells, you're def definitely going to want to try to dump some of those out somewhere. OK, other problems that people run into is I think often because you haven't seen the whole gate hierarchy um, in the figure that is in your paper, you don't necessarily understand the sort logic as well as you might want to. So um, sort logic started out with Boolean, where you had gates, and those gates were all connected to each other by the Boolean operators of and, or, or not. Um, we moved to a hierarchy, which looks like this. And this is mostly what we're using at this point. Um, when we tab in, uh, we are using an and. And when we have a situation here like this, where we have a vertical line, that is uh, a knot. So um, parallel gates that are drawn in different plots can also cause problems. This is the Boolean version of this same thing, where we have all cells, live cells, CD6060, and then a knot, because the Lin positives and the Lin negatives are not going to be sorted in the same um, selection. Some people like this as a Venn diagram. As a correctly done Venn diagram, what you can see is that we're not getting any overlap in our sort population. So we want to make sure we have this and not a situation where there's overlap. It, when you do have overlap, those are conflicts. And those conflicts on most sorters will not be sorted. In some sorters, they will be sorted to the first population, usually the left. Um, anytime you have a series of AND gates um, and you're trying to clean up a sample, you should remember that you can use these in any order. Most people will show you a scatter gate first. There's no reason you need to do a scatter gate first if these are all ANDs, right? Um, in this particular case, with the scatter gate, we didn't really know where to put it, but a singlet gate is a nice clear gate. So you could start with that, or you could start by cutting out the CD45 positives and then running through your other cleanup gates. You can see that gets us to a nice population of clean CD4s at the end of this. It was less good when we started with the scatter gate because we were not able to get as clean a separation on the CD45, and we weren't able to get as good a lymphocyte gate. You have a limit to how many times you can gate in um, on a cell sorter and sort that population. So you want to make sure that you're able to Convince your mind that it's OK to, to change the order if it needs to be changed. So this is what this looks like in Boolean. They're all ands. You can do it in any direction. OK, so other things that can happen with bad sort logic. And this is just software things that happen where sometimes you've changed the axes on your plots or you've done something else. And gates will get out of order. So in this case, um, we started with this and came across a uh, independent sort operator who was running their 
clean up gates, but did not realize that their P1 gate did not include their live cells. And you can see that they had kind of a lot of dead cells and they're gonna sort some of those dead cells into their P3 sort gate. The way that this should be done is that these all should be ANDs. And then you end up with this nice clear Venn diagram and your um, dead cells are not going into your sort population. I'm not telling you a whole lot of detail about what cell types these are because I don't think it matters to what I'm, what I'm explaining. Okay, um, other ways you can do, um, you can end up with problems with your sort logic is a lot of people in analysis, they like to go through and they're gonna do their basic gates, right? And then they're gonna go and make this plot, okay? And then they're also gonna go from that live cell gate and make another plot. And they're gonna determine, okay, all six of these are gonna be my sort gates. Well, here's what this looks like on a Venn diagram, right? You don't wanna sort this. You really do not wanna sort something that might be P1 and a little bit of P5 and some P4. Like, what are you gonna do with that later? The right way to do this is to make sure that you have a mutually exclusive gating strategy. In this case, we backgated and we found that these populations were coming from this population here. And we were able to say, okay, we're gonna take that P3, we're gonna move P4, 5, 6 down under P3, and then we can take P1, P2, P4, 5, and 6 and sort them, and they are all mutually exclusive. You cannot use P3 in this example as a sort gate because, as you can see, it is not mutually exclusive with 4, 5, and 6. Uh, a tip off that this is happening is that when you sum up the percentage of parent for P1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, they are greater than 100%. That's a good indicator that you did something you don't want to do. Okay, so a nice strategy if you can work your way around it to avoid this kind of mutually exclusive gate is to um, essentially treat each each plot as a not gate. So um, in this case, I'm going from CD45 cells and I'm gonna take that down to CD3 versus 11B. I'm gonna gate my 11B positives and my three positives. And then I'm gonna take this three negative 11B negative. From that, I can go down to my NKs and my, I forgot what that is, B cells, right? Um, here, I can take my CD3 positives. I can gate my fours and eights. I don't think that there's anything else I want to sort in there, but I could draw a net double negative gate and take that to another plot. Um, here, I'm going to take my CD11B gate, and I'm going to move that to Li6C, Li6G. And once I do that, I can identify my um, monocytic MDSCs, my granulocytic MDSCs, and these double negatives, which I can then separate out into BCs and uh, Max. This is a mutually exclusive um, gating strategy. Here's what it looks like on a Venn diagram, and here's what yours should look like. Consider those double negative gates. You don't want to end up with overlapping populations, and if you're doing it fast because your sort operator is annoyed because you showed up two hours late and you brought a billion mice, you, these are mistakes that are going to happen. So as careful as the sort operator will be to make sure that this doesn't happen, you need to be thinking about, as a researcher, about making sure that this is not included in your sort. I think I'm mostly at the end of my talk. Oh, I did want to add two slides on index sorting because I think it's underutilized. It's a way to do a retrospective analysis of cells sorted into each well as a sort gate. So typically you would stain with a bigger panel than you're planning to sort on. Um, you want multiple small populations, but if you can create a gate that defines all of those small populations and cells that you're interested in, you can put one of those cells randomly into each well, and you can know after the fact which one went into which well. This also increases the starting frequency of your sort population, and that's going to increase the purity. Um, Multiple populations of interest that might work for this are some things like stem cells, hematopoietic stem cells. People do this a lot for multiple tetramers, for different types of libraries. And being able to know which cell went into which well will tell you even in a T cell assay, how was this one a classical memory? Was this one an effector memory? Was this one, you know, you can know a lot about the phenotype. So get the most data that you can get out of your sort while improving your sort. And here's my example of that. You have a tube with a lot of different cells. The, the ones that are in gray, I think we don't want, and the other ones we do want. These are um, mouse hematopoietic stem cells. We can divide these any number of different ways, and we can have a whole lot of different markers past this. And what we're going to do is just sort this first hematopoietic stem cell gate, 
And then we're going to sort into a well and get every type of cell that falls into that gate and know which well it went into. This can be helpful for all kinds of um, applications, and I don't know why it doesn't catch on more. Um, we have some people who have bought in and they love it, and other people who just think it's magic. Um, and I want to thank everybody in my lab, um, wonderful team that we have, uh, Karen, Bina, Catherine, David, Matt, uh, for, former members that we still miss. Uh, we miss Sarah, um, Deanna Bonilla, who was another speaker here, Ryan Jewell, who is a um, PD, uh, I don't know what his title is. He's a high parameters specialist. Yeah, um, anyway, great people, all the flow Texans. You guys have been my friends for years. Love you guys. And a few other people that really taught me a lot about sorting over the years. So thank you. I hope that was all clear then. I'm running away. Really. Let's have a chat. <laughs> Do we yeah, have to? <laughs> that was a great overview. Uh, thank, thank you so much. Um, no, I, I just, you know, it's it's been 50 years or over 50 years that um, sorters have been invented. And, and you wonder, you know, when you're talking about gating logic, which is quite important. I, I guess that before when we were sorting, you know, two, three markers, it wasn't too critical, but nowadays we're we're dealing with you know, 10, 15 on a normal basis, right? So on a regular basis. So um, would it be nice to have a, a software that would immediately identify, hey, wait, there's a conflict here um, and where the conflict is. Like I loved your Venn diagrams. Like, if we could just visualize that, a software that could show us immediately that, that would be amazing. So there was software that did that a while back, but it, would, it wouldn't actually tell you where your conflict was. It would just flash yellow. Okay. So all your conflict of defense would just flash yellow on the software. Right. And you would still you, have to go and... Like you have a problem here. <laughs> exactly. But, but we could go beyond that. I mean, we're talking about AI, right? We don't even need to go there. There, there could a... be tools to do this. And it's something right. that should be done. It's, it's just an under... It's something people don't think about, and I think it ruins a lot of people's experiments right. and creates a lot of artifacts and maybe creates publications that tell us things that aren't what we want right. right. to focus on going forward. And it puts a lot of pressure on the, the core operators, right? That's yeah, it's funny with the dynamic where the core operator and the scientist are not necessarily, you know, right. able to communicate exactly. well enough to get these things across. Right. So exactly. thank you, Bree. Yeah. Hi. Thank, thank you for... Really nice presentation. Uh, I just have, or you already emphasized how important the sample quality is, and that's just something that I see time and time again in my own core. I think, like, really, one big difference between analysis and sorting is that you can gate the debris out in analysis or increase the threshold to eliminated from your data yeah, file, just, but it will end up in your collection to be in, in sorting or you have to really slow down the, the sorting speed if you have lots of debris and that's one big difference between analysis and sorting. Yes, that's a good point. I did talk about that a little bit last year, but I cut it for time this year. Thank you so much, everybody. I think it's time for prizes. Raffle. Okay. Raffle coming soon. Thank you. Here's some. Can I open? <laughs> um no <laughs> more part. I, I don't have any more parts sorry about that that was uh, they went we have we have an issue and once you can buy them um if, if you want to wait till the end and, and i go i can actually can at the same time but but yeah we'll, we'll, we're still doing on so i'll talk to you later okay
Well, let's talk. Go ahead. So I'm going to give down for two sites of ethics and two on cards. Huh? Okay, so then, so then I just gave you one of the other ones. Yeah. Two jackets and two. Oh, great. Okay. Okay, we're we're gonna get this raffle started real quick. Billy, are you doing that? No, no, no. I do. Uh, I do. We have a slot for it, then. That's the. Uh, not to my knowledge. All right. Okay. Real perfect. And I'll. We're gonna. I have the online. So for the online people, we've got all your names in a list here, and we're going to um, uh, select randomly. You have to be logged into YouTube so that you can reply. But we're going to do our, our in-person raffles uh, first. And these are from our vendors. And we're outrageously grateful to, to all the sponsors of Flowtex for everything they make this whole conference possible it's a completely free event and has been for years and years you get your full meal paid for which is incredible <laughs> so thank you to the vendors for this stuff and for everything all right joel all right yes thank 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 oh, yeah, the vendors. thanks the vendors <laughs> without it this wouldn't be possible um it's really great um i i did have a we had a slide here that we've been showing through and it's been rotating through um so anyway so here is the lamb that this is a very uh, Carla, no, I'm sorry, then. Yeah. Rui, you're gonna be the um, yes, the random chip. All right, just, random. So, this is <laughs> what's the first prize up for this? That I close my eyes, we could, we could answer. Okay. Okay. All right, side tech jacket. Huh. <laughs> if you're here, you got to be here to win. Padmini. Yeah. It's my Padmini, Padmini oh, yes. Narayana. I was trying to pronounce the name correctly. <laughs> yeah, check, double check. She gets she's the first one. She gets to pick the size. Okay. Well, that hurt. Well, again, you can't, you can't win two prizes for this. All right. Let's give it a little shuffle here. Oh, good. Okay. Thank you, Sidechat. A little shuffle. Did anyone check these for dub duplicates? Someone could be cheating. <laughs> okay. So we have Maria Teresi Dimane. There we are. All right. We have the other Sidechat cap. What's up next? It's a, it's a, it's a hey, double check real quick. If it's if it's small, we'll double up. Yeah, it's a, it's it's a water, water bottle. bottle. Water bottle. You want to double up? Oh, it's a wine bottle. It's like a wine. Bottle. Oh yeah. Okay. Does it have wine in it? All right. I don't think so. All right, you want to pick? Are you gonna double this up? Sure. Otherwise, all right. Riyazat, Riyazat oh. Ali. Ah, oh, there we are. He wants a parking validation and a wine bottle. There you Thank go. You. Thank you. Thank you, Sony. All right. <laughs> all right. What's next? If it's, all right. Is there anything in it? A water bottle. All right. All right, it's got a whole lot of fun stuff. Let's grab it. Agilent. Next here. person. E I Lin. E I Lin. Yeah, just give me that. All right. What's it? Yeah, just him. What's what's next up on the docket? We got a lot of 
Got a lot of glasses. All right, double bag. Okay, there's a little okay. little gym bag. Right. The next prize winner is Hong Jian. All right. Got your little gym workout kit. All right, here we go. Oh, the, the jealous one. Right. This is the mug from Thermo Fisher. Here's a temperature controlled mug by Therm from Thermo Fisher. Apparently, they want you to keep your coffee or tea nice and hot. Okay. I will trade that for a parking validation. Someone that needs it. Agarwal. Okay. The worst job was just trying to read the names, <laughs> pronounce the names. All right, what's next? Ooh, a computer day pass. There we go. Yeah, James Lee. All right. To announce first. Let's put it, it. No, we have a Starbucks. Yeah, yeah put, put it with something. Yeah, okay. we gotta, otherwise, we're going to be here forever. Yeah, but, <laughs> okay, no, we don't have anything. There we are. Okay. All right. Starbucks card and an Agilent little tag. Yeah, yeah. yeah, who's the Starbucks from? Cytex. Cytex. All right. Cytex, Starbucks, and Agilent. We're mixing the two. Yeah, maybe, who knows? Maybe one will buy the other. Brittany Airy. Brittany? Oh, all right. That's yeah, a little. All right. All right. Sports, another sports bag with a towel and a water bottle. All right. It looks like. IT Ben Mahant. Ah. Sorry, it doesn't have a rice owl on it. And I'm just so you know, I'm being professional and mixing these up so Rui doesn't cheat. All right. Harsha Vardhan Bismi. Sorry. <laughs> Simplifying all the names. <laughs> you know I'm looking for the hardest name. Right? All right. What else we got? We Let's see we got. Three things left. All right. We got another merger here with an Agilent and a, and a, from, and a SciTech gift card. Friend. Bin two. All right. Someone who likes to watch the lecture twice at YouTube and in the person at the same time. Last one for last one for the vendor prizes. Ah <laughs> that's that's the that's our flow tax. That's the Raj Yadav. No, where is he? He's got to be here. But yeah, I. That was the easiest thing. Uh, all right. Sorry, you got to be at, here to win. You can't have someone pick it up for you. Joshua Sun. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I do too. That's great. Thank so, everyone, thanks so much for participating in the vendor portion of that. That's. The vendor, without the vendors, we really wouldn't be able to, to hold this. And like I said, because of that, we've actually held off a couple things for our online. So we're going to try to do, because online may have little response, we're going to do, we're going to do two online Amazon gift cards and then, and then two in-person gift cards. All right. And they're going to be. So we can't 
broadcast it because I it's on my computer here. So oh wait. I can do that. I can share my screen. All right, we're working on the technology on this. So shake that one up while she's working on that. So the first one on here. <laughs> oh. oh, there it is. Yay. Oh, that's much bigger than I expected. <laughs> Hang on. We're uh, we're trying to give the folks at home a headache here. Sorry, sorry, everyone. Okay. So remember, mind that there's a delay. Okay, there is a delay, right? So I'm gonna click this. This has like 450 names in it, which means of the 80 people there, I hope you're a quick responder. So <laughs> let's do it. We're spinning. It's like a 20 second. Let's see our first potential winner. If you're there, you gotta be logged in. So Hala Vadi, if you're there, say it now in the chat on YouTube. Okay. Yeah, you could roll the other one too. Yeah. Watch. We could always do two at a time. Okay. And if if anybody, somebody, can somebody be watching the chat? Let me take it's a not me, Leroy. Okay. We, we All right. Take a screenshot. Okay. <laughs> Next one, maybe a winner, maybe. We're gonna have two winners online. Okay. Lydia Bed Bederka. Bederka. Lydia Bederka. If you're there, Lydia, let us know. All right. So now while well, we wait a little bit for the for the virtual world to catch up to the real world, we're gonna draw for Joel Cedarstrom. Get out of oh, here. Oh, no. Oh. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Sadna Agarwal. Wait. No, oh. that's not yeah. yeah, but she already. No, it doesn't matter. This is this is the free oh. prize, so you don't oh. give up on it. Okay, cool. Yes, you can win you twice on it. this guy. This is so that if you the win a, a, a wonderful gym set, you still have a chance at a $100 gift card to Amazon. Leroy, so, did we hear anything? I need you. The, what I need you to do here, though, is you need to write this. Okay. That's how it goes. All, All right, right, I'm going to do another spin online. Yeah. Oh, sure. I say it's a hundred dollar Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see if we get anybody online. Brian Merritt, if you're out there, let us know. Brian Merritt. Brian Merritt, if you're online, this is when you speak up. Gotta let us know. And we, we'll do one more for the online. Okay. It's not a name I could say. Maybe Polish. Uh, but Gregor's Mirig. Ah. <laughs> if you're out there, let us know. Let us know. All right. All right, so hundred dollar gift card from Amazon. Scott Olson, are you here? He's well, here. Come on down, get your card so you can put your email on it. Woohoo! I'm not walking up there. <laughs> All right, let's let's see if we got anybody online. Any winners, Leroy? No. Hopefully, we'll get one in four, one in six. Greg's, Greg's here. here. Greg's our winner. Bakti, Bakti's in my lab. If she's oh, here, right. I'll be so happy. I Bakhti don't think Patel. she is. <laughs> Text Wait, me, Bakti. Bakti. I know, but so Gregor's, make sure to get your email in there. That's how we send this out. Yeah. All right. Let's let's do one more for the in in person group. Yeah, it's it's taken. Flowtex at flowtex.org. So Gregor's. Greg, Gregors, send a, an email to flowtex at flowtex.org and we will collect your information to give you a gift card. <laughs> All right. Last but not least, Connie. <laughs> Connie! Look at last, but Connie Peretta, one of what she's been coming to flowtex from Tulane here. We love it. 
Thank you so much. So you know, here's a little. Well, are we waiting still on a some line? We'll see. Let me do. Okay, but you vouch. Okay, so we have Lydia and so Lydia, All right, that's it. Okay, very good. All right, everyone. So just a little background on this. This is a Flotex bag that I went in and dug out from a, <laughs> one of the ones. It was one of the things we handed out over 10 years ago as one of the Flotex uh, uh, little things. We, we stopped handing stuff out because, well, we don't like you guys that much. But, no, I'm kidding. We love you. But here's – but so just so you know, a little history there is that this is a, a little – we used to give out these little Flotex bags. And it's great. Um, so I really want to thank everyone for coming. We're we're really we're really so happy you stuck it through with us online. Thank you guys. It's it's so great to know that there's people out there that want to see what we have to say down here and all the and what and all the experts we bring in here. It's it's really appreciated that you guys can all show up for this. Um, really, it's it's great putting this this conference on. We really get the as the as, as a committee, we really get to pull in some things that we really want to see ourselves or we want to have all y'all see. And, and so it's just a great opportunity. I would like to take this chance to thank the committee themselves. Um, if you're a committee member in here, would you please, and a planning person for folk text, please stand up so you can take a, a round of applause. We really, these guys work really hard all year round. We, we, we meet all the time. And they and they give up they give up their Tuesday morning meeting so that they can uh, come and help and and plan this for y'all. Um, and 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 going into that, if you guys want to want to help and be a meeting planner with us, even in, in little ways, um, you can always reach out to, to us at uh, flowtex at flowtex.org, and and we'll we can put you on the list and we'll reach out or just start kind of uh, talking to us. You know, talk to your core managers who's part of it or any one of us that are part of it. And we'll we'll get you involved somehow because we we always need and appreciate the help. Um, once again, I'd like to thank our vendors. Um, they have done a remarkable job. Uh, they 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 really helped us out. And and as we're all transitioning back to in real life, um, it's been really great to get together and talk with them and, and catch up. Um, I'd also like to thank all of you all again for being here. Um, other than that. If you guys, if there is someone who needs parking validation, I will put a window out where I'll help pay for it out of UT as you guys leave. Um, if not, uh, we will have Flotex again next year. We haven't set the dates yet, so just stay tuned. Know that everyone, once you've registered here, we add you to our Flotex list, so you'll get emails. If you don't want to be that on that list, you can unsubscribe. We're not going to force you. Um, but anyway, so just look forward to the save the date coming out in the future. Also look forward to some other educational and interesting events we might put on through the year. Thank you all for attending this year's Flotex.